everyone. Welcome to Providence United Methodist Church. Grateful for your presence and delighted that all of you are here. Um, I've been serving here going on my fifth year and it's been a blessing, but it's a blessing to have all of you. Um, I am so glad to have Dr. Kenny here. I took my systematic theology with him. And what was amazing was Dr. Kenny would walk in a room and he would say, can I share my devotion with you this morning? And we were like, you know, kids just laughing. Yeah, 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 share it with us. And he would literally just blow us away. He hadn't even taught yet. That was just his devotion from the morning. But God has gifted him in, uh, in such a huge way. And Dr. Kenny, to be here at Providence and sharing your gift with us, I'm in awe that God would do that for us. So I want to say thank you. Um, just a little housekeeping for some of you that might need restrooms straight down the hall on your left. As you make that left, you'll see the bathrooms on your right. Um, Ted Smith is going to come and, and bring some words, the director of Connectional Ministries, Ted Smith. Let's give him a hand. It's all right. Thank the church for hosting, my good friend Derek, uh, the pastor, for hosting and leading this, and the team that has put this event together. Let's give God a praise for that group. When Derek said, we got Dr. Kenny coming, I was like, y'all got Dr. Kenny? <laughs> he and I have really only passed to and fro in different events. So I said, that dude is deep. <laughs> And if y'all got Dr. Kenny, I don't care what he's leading or teaching, I'm going to be there. And I imagine that many of you feel the same way, and we are so blessed. Dr. Kenny, thank you. Thank you. He doesn't have to be here. He could be in a whole lot of other places, but him sharing his gift and his ministry. So I do want to thank him as well. Uh, as Derek said, uh, my ministry right now is in the Virginia Conference, for those of you I haven't met. And when we say Director of Connectional Ministries... I no longer take it for granted that anybody, Methodist or not, has any idea what that means. <laughs> so I usually give the, the secular equivalent. My ministry is like a chief of staff. And so that's what I do for Bishop Lewis and for the Virginia Conference. And so on Bishop Lewis's behalf, I want to bring her greetings. She is doing well. Uh, I was telling Derek, her physical therapists are putting her through the paces in a good way. Um, and for many who are United Methodist clergy in Virginia, we are looking forward to seeing you on an event that we're having called Recalibrate. Our bishop has been on medical leave for six months, and so we've had a time of not being together. And so if you are United Methodist clergy at whatever level or status, we hope to see you Thursday the 24th at Recalibrate. Dr. Kenny, we're doing something we hadn't done before. We're going to Virginia State. <laughs> That's a first in the 238-year history of Virginia. It's that significant. So I want to just greet you. Thank you for coming out. Good to be in worship and learning with you all. And again, on behalf of Bishop Lewis, I bring her greetings. And I myself am delighted to be here with you today. Thank you. to worship. Um, for those who are on the Goodson Academy team, would you please stand? And Mandy Newman, I need you to stand because this is my co-chair. We decided to do this together and I'm grateful for her. And JD, come on up. Write us the big check. Come on, I know you got it. <laughs> Good morning. As we begin our time of sharing together, I would like to introduce our presenter for today. You have a bio, and that bio is very extensive. But I want to talk about some other things. Uh, growing up in West Virginia, he was a football player, played linebacker, 
made it to Marshall University. But as he says, as you go from one level to another, the athletes get bigger and stronger and faster. It was his desire to become a professional football player. But you know, the Bible tells us that there was a man named David, and he wanted to build a temple for the Lord. And God said, it's good that it's in your heart, but you have a son. He has a son named Eric Kenny. And in 1990, I saw this man jump for joy because in 1990, Eric's Florida Gators won the national championship. <laughs> and he went on from there to become a professional football player with the Tennessee Titans. So I want to present to you the father of Aaron today. <laughs> as he was called when he got to Florida. It wasn't Dr. John Kennedy. That, that's Eric's dad over there. <laughs> but we are privileged to have one of God's servants, uh, a man who is my friend, Dr. John W. Kenny, Dean Emeritus of the School of Theology, Virginia Union University. Hear ye him. Amen? Amen. Thank you. The Lord be with you. I'd like to invite you to rise, if you are able, and join me in the call to worship. When God calls God's people into communities of faith, we have heard and responded to that call. Who will share that call with others? How shall we live so that God's faith communities will be healthy, vital, and inviting? We come to worship God and prepare ourselves for healing of the community of faith. Our first hymn means open my eyes. And let us worship the Lord with our soul, spirit, heart, and your loud voice, okay? <laughs> Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of trees thou hast for me. Place in my hand the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently. Open my eyes. 
Good morning. Let us pray together. O oh God, our help and our hope, you have established the church, calling it to be faithful in every time and place. Draw all into communities of faith to praise and serve you. Lead and guide us leaders to fasten our attention and share our ministries so that we receive others who have not responded to your call to community. By the, oh, by the power of your Holy Spirit, make us those who shape ministries that call all people to faithfulness to you in our communities of faith. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 16. I will be reading verses 1 through 13. Hear now these words. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you great grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem, the elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on his height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. We praise the God of creation this day, the God who has privileged us with this moment, the God of amazing grace, shared presence, and power, the God who is the God of constancy, and the God who never fails. As we embrace the gift of this day, we do so with the fundamental recognition that none of us tilted the earth at 23 and a half degrees on its axis. None of us set it spinning at a thousand miles an hour, a little completing a rotation in a 24 hour period, promising us a sunrise and a sunset. None of us set the earth maintaining what the phys 
physics would call the critical velocity necessary to maintain the distance between the Earth and the sun. One mile faster, we would break the gravitational pull of the sun and be hurled into outer darkness. One mile slower, we'd be drawn into the sun and be destroyed. But somehow, without human mechanization or intervention, this Earth is positioned to sustain life on this terrestrial ball. Some would look for an explanation. I simply say, there must be a God somewhere. <laughs> so I thank God for this day. Uh, there has been uh, a kind of a, 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 a misguided theological approach in the church in recent years that is always focused on getting something from God. And if you stop and think, we say that prayer, give us this day our daily bread. The theology of the church shifted to the bread. Lord, give us our bread. And the more bread you got, the more it demonstrates your relationship with God. But if you really say that prayer, there ought to be a praise break and moment after this day. Because the greatest thing that you have is this day. If you don't get this day, all the bread in the world will not do a thing for you. And after God gives you this day, anything else you receive is surplus blessing. God, I thank you for this day. God never gives time and day without purpose. My prayer today is that both I and you might be partners in purpose with God such that then when this day is over, God can smile and say, you've been a good partner today. But any time we're honest about partnership, partnership is never grasped or achieved. It's always lived into. The minute any of you are married, the minute you think you're married and you got it, that's when you start losing it. Because marriage is always in front of you. You always have to be investing in it. Any deep relationship is dynamic and developing and never defined by a set body. So I thank God. And at this point in my life, even though I've been teaching, involved in theological education, this year I celebrate 50 years, amen, as a student and as a teacher. I'm so glad that I remain a seeker. I wake up every morning saying, Lord, teach me. And it's okay, God, if you blow my mind again. <laughs> and if you undermine and collapse every one of my assumptions, even what I've been teaching all my life. And so God, I begin the day seeking you and because I recognize that my eyes still need to be opened, forgive me. And God, I praise you for taking my ignorance and creating illumination out of my darkness. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So I begin this day not as an expert, but someone who wants to partner with God and you in continuing the seeking. I must admit that what I'm going to share this day has been inspired by my friend and colleague uh, when she prepared the worship service. Did you all just hear the song we sang? Open thou my eyes that I might see. Well, the appropriate inference drawn from the suggestion in the song is that no matter how well you think you see, you're still blind. And you're asking God to open your eyes. We'll end this day with bring forth the kingdom. How do we begin with seeing more clearly that we might more appropriately define the character of the future? How does our seeing affect how we construct the end 
And how does our end drive our behavior in the present? And I will suggest to you at the close of this day that much of our discourse about heaven affirms the design of the demonic more than the design of God. And that our own discourse about eternity may be the evidence of our captivity. So we begin this day with the theme, look again. And we'll look again at two texts and we'll look again at how we construct theology. And let me say this for later, but I'll say it now. The greatest threat to knowing God is to know God too well already. And you start bowing to the shrine of what you know rather than being available for a God to teach you. One of my struggles with the academy is that I have to sometimes deal with experts rather than educators. Educators are learners. Experts presume to know and coerce everybody to conform to what they know. What it really means is you're teaching them to know God and you're really teaching them to know you. And then you reduce the possibilities of having our eyes open to embrace my blindness. Let's look again. You heard the text read. You heard it. Very familiar text coming from the story of the anointing of David. And you look at it, the prophet of Saul has been heard the heart of God and recognized uh, the, 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 the Samuel, the prophet of God, to recognize that the current leader is not in harmony with God. God speaks and says, the one who has been chosen to lead you does not honor me. Samuel is grieved. No, I, you know, I, I had a relationship with him. We're good, we're cool, he's a nice guy. I really like what... And then God says, how long are you going to keep grieving over him rather than preaching the truth that will lead us to an alternative future? And he says, well, wait a minute. I want you to go anoint. I've chosen someone from the family of Jesse and Ephratite uh, of Bethlehem who has eight sons. I've chosen one. Go to him and you anoint the son. And he says, but wait a minute, Lord. If I start talking about anointing somebody other than Saul, some of the folk in power are going to get mad. They might even try to kill me. God, are you, are you, huh? He said, no, no, you just, okay, let, 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 I, since, you're, since you're worried about your comfort, let me give you a, <clears throat> let me give you a method of achieving my desire in a fashion that might not bring a, a, a significant consequence to you. Tell him you're just doing your religious duty and offering a sacrifice. No. <laughs> and then here comes Eliab or Eliab, and he comes out and he's strong and he's mighty. And immediately the preacher said, Man, this is the one. Look at him. He fits all the standards, all the categories, all if it fits everything. Yeah, this is the one. Hey, Amen. I'm ready to go. And God said, Uh. Uh-huh. I'm mm, mm, no. Look again. Look again. Because the way you're looking is not the way I look. And you're getting ready to put someone in the leadership of the congregation based upon a distorted rubric of appropriateness for the job. Look again. So wait a minute, I did, I followed the policy. I look, look. He's this tall, he looks like this, he's this red. Yeah, he fits it. Look again. Do you see what I see? 
you're looking at some stuff that misses what is really required for him to be the one who leads my people. You're looking at stuff. I'm looking at his heart. And then immediately they bring out the next. Why? Well, he's tall. He's Immediately they bring out the next. And then finally Samuel gets us and says, wait, no, nope, these aren't the ones. There got to be somebody else that we're missing. Oh, yeah, there is one more son, but he's not in much. Huh? He's got, no, he, he couldn't possibly be, because he's out there taking care of the sheep. He doesn't have the credentials. He doesn't have the status. He doesn't have, he doesn't have the job. Amen. He doesn't, he doesn't fit. And then he comes in and the true prophet has to say, anoint him. This is the one that God has chosen. And then the prophet could go back to Raymond. He could just say, okay. One of the great crises in the church now is that we are using the same rubric over and over again, expecting a different result. Work with me. Y'all, is the outline up there? Okay. The season, the site. Hmm? Here you have it. You have a season, right? Which is giving rise to a reality. Then you have sight that establishes how you make your judgments. But then you return to the source and you have to make a shift. The season, the sight, the source, and the shift. We pray God's blessings upon this. May we be faithful. May God be honored. May the truth be spoken according to God's will and way. And may we find ourselves growing because we've participated in this day. The season. Look at the season. It was a season where someone was in leadership that God could not celebrate. Here's the season. And with all that could have been said positive, God is saying, I can't countenance and affirm what he has become and is doing. And if you look back in it, we always quote that uh, obedience is better than sacrifice because we know what Saul did when God had given him directions and he altered the directions because he thought something was better. Come on. Amen. In other words, God has told me what to do. Now, I don't want to get into the exegetical issues and make a debate here about some of the issues that might rise up because the real question is there's some questions even in there about behavior in relation to other cultures because if I would interpret the Bible in a certain way using a certain her hermeneutic, I would justify what's happening in Syria right now and would be worried about the Christians and not the Kurds. Do y'all hear what you hear what you hear what I'm saying? I was listening to a very prominent radio television show that comes on in this area, and their great concern was we can't agree with our president because it places the Christians in jeopardy. What about the Kurds? Here, 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 there's a season, and God says, wait a minute. I, I have rejected him because he has taken the religion and used it as an instrument for the propo promotion of his personal agenda. Look, 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 because look what it says. It says, guess what? I told you to do something. You shifted what I told you to do because you, told, you thought you could be better thinking and appropriate for me. And you even the reason you said you did it is because you wanted to sacrifice to me. See, the issue is 
Your obedience is better than sacrifice because when you start deciding what is right, you no longer listen to God and establish your own agenda. No, come on, come on. Do you understand? And guess what? Now you don't have the faith in God. You have your religion. In my religion, we don't listen to God. When God speaks, we make adjustments and adaptations to conform to what we think is better. And we, have, we always say obedience is better than sacrifice, but you need to go back and read the 15th chapter because it's, guess what, guess what it says? It says rebellion is as bad as witchcraft and arrogance is idolatry. Because arrogance and an anointing can never mix. Because arrogance blocks an anointing. You show me someone arrogant, huh? They'll claim they're anointed. <laughs> And that's a fundamental contradiction because your arrogance will not let you be open to God's correction, formation, development, and change. Come on. And we admit the reason that he's rejected is rooted in his arrogance. I can construct religion the way I want to construct it, and I can tell God how to be God. And God says, I've rejected him. And look what happens here in this season. The prophet is so committed to the personality, he grieves rather than glorifies God. Oh, y'all miss me. See, he's so constructed to the individual. Come on, come on. No, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, God. I, we, we did, did, we did, did. No, no, God, do you really want to do this? And God is saying yes, but he is grieving because God is up to something different than the one with whom He's had relationship. Mm. What happens when our preaching is shaped by personalities rather than the presence? See, I want to show you why the prophet becomes blind. But not only is the prophet struggling because of his being enamored with a personality rather than honoring God's call. He is reticent and reticent because he knows if I preach what God called, some of the folk in power are going to get mad. Oh, no. No, literally, he even goes to God. God, if I really do what you have asked me to do, some folk going to want to kill me. And what happens is our, the music of our ministry and the power of our pronouncements are muted by our desire for comfort and privilege. If I really preach this, if I really do what you said for me to do, God, don't you know that some of these folk going to get angry? And they may even want to fire me. What a wonderful gift to be fired because you're faithful. And what a tragedy it is when you can be comfortable because you're compromised. <laughs> Look again. Look again. And so all of a sudden here in the season, God has to remind the preacher, the prophet. Because what he does, what it reveals is that he is not only captured by privilege, come on, and personality, he's captured by pattern and practice. Because when he's looking for new leaders, he goes back to the same rubric and the paradigm that got this leader. Come on. Well, yes, he's this tall. Can I get bad? Can I get me bad? He's got this degree. <laughs> He's got this pedigree, come on, uh-huh, and he's got this cultural background, and he's been exposed to this, and notice I'm saying he. 
because the rubric oftentimes doesn't even include she. No, never mind. <laughs> and it's, nah, I'm gonna be, you, all told, you all know me, right? I'm bad. <laughs> and if she is she, even when she rises up, she's viewed with suspicion for no other reason than the fact that she's she. And if she happens to be black, never mind, that's another. <laughs> no, come on, walk with me, family. So, 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 literally what he says is, okay, God, I'm going to do what you want to do. But he goes right back to what got him saw. He's this tall. He sits him. Uh-huh. I got it. Here's the program that we use. We will never have one of these. We don't anoint these kind. We don't anoint that kind. We don't anoint, nope, here's the reasons why we exclude you. Here's the reason we do this, we do this. Because why? Because we already have our rubric and it's got nothing to do with God. It's our tradition. This is the way we've always done it. And don't, please, don't have a problem. I'm not doing anything out of order. I'm just following policy. And then policy becomes the mask that I use to preserve the privilege. And so he, and he said, no, it's not him. So guess what? He goes back and looks. And then the source speaks and says, I don't look like y'all look. Can you open your eyes? I don't do things the way you've done it. You've reduced my future to the future you create rather than discerning where my spirit is leading and changing. And you are working to repeat what you've always done rather than see deep enough that God may have other people who need to be at the table. Hmm. And so... So the source speaks, and all I want to say is, I can't speak for anybody else, but I'm on a journey back to the source, Sankofa. I'm going back to go forward. I'm meeting afresh again, God, because even as a pastor for 43 years, I've come to confess that I have established an institution that requires fidelity to the institution and not God. To the degree that I, I and can I say this, that I may be the very agent forming people out of Christ rather than growing them into Christ. And can I say this? For African Americans, there's a great risk that we're facing. We're going to be Christianized out of Christianity. Because the faith that has brought us is now being transformed or violated by external coercive powers that tell you, now this is what's right and this is what's wrong. And if you want to be promoted, you better be wrong. God is saying, I don't do it the way you do it. I don't see the way you see. I'm looking at something called the heart. And we're saying, oh no, uh, that's that hard. What's that got to do with it? You need to leave that heart stuff in the church. We're talking about the institution. Oh, no, no, stay with it. Don't bring none of that emotion, that feeling. That's one of the reasons, uh, man, we can't, really, uh, we can't really embrace women because they tend to be emotional. And so all of you sisters who come here, We've got to make sure we help you 
lose the gift of your being in order for you to serve the church and not your Lord. No, nope. oh, Lord Jesus, have mercy. <laughs> can, can I, will y'all just let me be this provocative to just push us? Why? And I, this is when we get into our workshop part as to how we have separated existence and emotion and the intellect are divided and you got to make a decision which side you're on. Because if you're emotional, you're ignorant. And I'm sure we can function on a higher plane than that. <laughs> but it's all part of our being ruled by a distortion of the design. And now that's what we're going to talk about in the workshop. But look, God is saying, look where you're not used to looking. See what you've never seen. Could this really be the power of the Holy Spirit? And that's why when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, if John Wesley could really talk to us about sanctification, <laughs> that it's not about blowing your mind. It's about stretching your mind where now dimensions of your consciousness have been dormant, have been activated by the power of the presence, and the only way that you can communicate what's happening is you dream dreams, you see visions, and you get a new tongue. <laughs> I have to speak. Words that used to come from me can't come from me anymore because the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Hallelujah. <laughs> and, so, and so the source says, and then guess what? Then there's a shift. Guess what the shift is? We cannot worship authentically till you go get the people that you've left out. Come on. He says, no, no, we can't fin no, we can't finish it until you find the one that you think is not worthy to be at the table, until you get the one you call the sheep tender. There can be no worship unless he's this one is at the table. You can't be my people. You can't be faithful to me while you've got certain people excluded. And if they're welcome, they have secondary status and are not full participants in the life because they don't fit the rubric. Ooh. Hmm. And there's a shift. They bring the one that you excluded. Notice, you are a member of the family, but you're the nobody. Because I've already assigned you a position based upon your age. Age is a biological function. So guess what I just told you? Your biology dictates whether you're at the table or not. Ooh. <coughs> You're the wrong gender, you're the wrong color, you're the wrong age. Oh, because these young people are going to tear the church up. We need one that looks just like. <laughs> Do I need to leave? No. <laughs> no, no, work with me, work with me. There is a shift occurring, you all. And God, it's not anti-God or anti-church. It's God. Doing the new thing that God always does. And when you really have the heart of God, the shift doesn't threaten you. It causes you to celebrate. Thank you. Thank you, God. One of the things I recognize, even as stepping down as dean, uh, and even as the stage I am in my life, uh, even as I look like, I recognize that I can't, I won't be the pastor of a church I've been with for 43, 43 years. I know that doesn't happen in the United Methodist Church, but I've been the pastor for 43 years. I've been able to walk with the people. I, the children that I baptized and that, I, that I, I, I held when they were birthed are now the adults, and, and I am doing their children, and the elders are now, I'm celebrating transitions, and we, are, we, we know what it is to be a, 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 just, just, just a family because we have walked. Now, there's always a jeopardy. There's jeopardy in that. Why? Because leadership becomes institutionalized, and I may be blind, and now I've formed a blind congregation. <laughs> now, there are risks. 
And so it's not a right or wrong, it's understanding all of these flows and dynamics. But in any event, you know, I, I, to, to walk with it, there's a shift occurring, y'all. This generation doesn't think like I think. I was with my granddaughters the other day, and they're, you know, they're 25 years old, and, and I, they, we were talking about something, and, you know, issues around, around uh, sex and things like that. I'm so glad they still talk. They'll talk to me about that. That's the first thing you got to learn as a good leader. You got to know that people, people don't feel threatened or fearful when they talk to you about the things that are real to them because it was not real to you. Never mind, never mind. <laughs> and so, so uh, uh, and I gave this answer, and my, my granddaughter, just, she said to me, Papa, that's a good Christian answer. <laughs> But that's not our answer. But you spoke Christian so well. <laughs> but then the reality of being able to sit with them and talk. Hmm? I was telling JD today, uh, it's another thing I believe that we, we miss in our preaching is honesty and transparency. We're so busy trying to be the perfect husband, the perfect this, the perfect that. We got to be the pure ones rather than letting folk know we struggle and we wrestle and we do every just like everybody else. Amen. And we make mistakes just like everybody else. And my grandson has been going through something and, you know, and yesterday I was so upset with him. I, had, I couldn't get near him. Come on, y'all. And y'all never been? Uh-huh. And the day driving down here, I told you, you know, the day I was just praying, God, give me wisdom how to deal with this grandson because he's going through some stuff. And I know the history, you understand? And I couldn't do it yesterday because I would have dealt with him. I had to reclaim my center because something was, come on, hallelujah, hallelujah. Here's the amazing good news. God is still speaking to us. Open your eyes that you might see. And what we're witnessing is not the demise of the church, but the faithful investment of God in the church of the future. Because guess what? I'm now, amen, almost halfway between my 70s and my 80s. So I'm not on that side. I'm on this side. The challenge and what I had to recognize is that I was doing ministry to preserve me, not the church. Because when I got into the church, it was about looking again. And here's the great gift to us who may be of a, a little older. It said, and Saul, Samuel anointed him, and immediately what? The Spirit. Can we surrender some things to the Spirit? rather than our control. Can we just be the agents where the spirit starts moving on another generation? And maybe we'll just have to go back to Rhema and let God do what God does. Hallelujah. Um, just recently, I preached a sermon a few weeks ago, Can I Borrow Your Eyes? It was our youth Sunday. And I heard so many sermons that I've heard preach. You know, it was Samson, and he had to get a little child to lead him. And he said, isn't it tragic that the children are leading the adults, that young folk, and we're supposed to be the leader? And I've heard three or four sermons like that. And all of a sudden, I, I said, my God, we're missing it. You may have the wisdom and the strength, but you don't have the eyes because you've been blinded by your complicity in the erection of the building. And you may have to borrow the eyes of another generation to show you. Because you know it's dysfunctional, but you're so blinded, you can't see anymore how to tear it down. And it may be the eyes of a younger generation that has to show you where to put your hands. 
And I can just go up to Ramah and see the God that I serve revitalizing, changing, and transforming a living church that doesn't look like I might want it to look full of people who do not see the way I see. To God be the glory. Now if I was in my congregation, this would begin where we would make a shift to Christological celebration. <laughs> Eric Matt, you know, you'd have to bring in the charismatic content. Because, now, now, look, now look what you would do with your charismatic content that would lead to celebration Christologically. You know why? Because somebody came from God that the world didn't approve of. Y'all didn't hear me. He was despised and rejected and he could have compromised. He could have come down. Yeah. But he was so faithful when folk told him, even when his crew, when his disciples told him, you shouldn't do this. He says, I got away. Even when he didn't want to do it, he said, Father, if there's some other way, but not my will, but thy will be done. And on a hill far away, when everybody else was saying, you want us to curse them? Father, forgive them, for I know not what they do. When other folk were saying they're just thieves, he was saying, this day you will be with me in paradise. And when everybody else was so ready to surrender to the powers, he said, creator, into thy hands I commend my spirit. The stone that the builders rejected became the chief found the cornerstone and the foundation. I'm so glad that God, the source, is in the business of shifting. And on the cross, you see a shift that the world still is not ready for. But the victory has been won. Look again. Look again. God is not through yet. Look again. And guess what? When you look again, rather than shift and fuss, you might shift and shout. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, um, we'll, I'll turn it back over to. As we uh, listen to God, let us respond to our Lord with our whole heart, whole mind, whole soul. Would you please rise and join me in the responsibility reading? From God, we have received grace upon grace. God has created all, redeemed all, and established the church as a place of healing, reconciliation, celebration, and service to the world that God has created. faithful community that draws others to God with us. Amen. Here in this plan new right is framing now in Gather 
sin Quedarás sin the lost and forsaken Quedarás sin the blind and the lame Call to us now and we shall awake We shall arise at the sound of the name We are the young suggest that uh, you all stand, greet each other for a moment, and just kind of prepare yourself for a shifting. Who's <laughs>
Uh, thank you all so much um, for affording me the privilege to be here and also um, um, for you, your investment in the moment. You understand what I'm saying? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I owe a great debt to United Methodist Church. I grew up in United Methodist Church. Uh, my family was all United Methodist. They, uh, uh, my mother and father left here United Methodist. My, they were all funerized in a United Methodist Church. Um, we were a part, when I was growing up, what was called the central jurisdiction. Yeah. Yes, Amen. And that's where all the black, and they grew up. My, my father was a lay a leader. My mother was a lay speaker all over the state of West Virginia. Uh, my mother was called to ministry, and uh, one of her, one of her, she had seven children in about twelve years. All of her energy went to what? Her children. You understand? And then when she wanted to move further in ministry, she didn't have a college degree. but seven children had been sent to college mm. through the sacrifice of a domestic. Do y'all hear what I'm... Mm -hmm. And at the end, there was no room for her. And when I became, short before I came dean, for she, she passed out, and it's only after her death I began to understand how, why she was so tight with me even though I was next to the youngest. It was simply because she was living vicariously through her son. My son, the preacher. <laughs> Come on. Huh? But she said something to me that is always stuck in my heart. She said to me as we were discussing one man, she had given me a book, Black Joy, that said she had used it in one of her things. And, and she said, Billy... I see how you, you're moving up. When you lead, will you make room for me? And I don't apologize for carrying that in my heart. And part of my ministry is simply making room for all those people who are gifted and talented and who have sacrificed for others, but there's no offering to them. <laughs> Just, I'm giving you my own, <laughs> what kind of drives my own passion. Um, um, as we look again, I'm going to do something, um, take you somewhere. How many of you all in here have been I've been privileged that you have taught me in a classroom. How many of y'all been in the classroom with me? Raise your hand. See, I want to show you, I want to show you something. See how? Mm -hmm. So you all are going to recognize some of this in new language because I've been doing this, this shift for over 30 years of trying to help people to understand how even the church is being held captive by a demonic design. And that demonic design is basically a hierarchy of value that does not just provide functional differentiation, it's ontological gradation. What did I just say? It means rather than saying, you got a function, right? And your function is different than mine. And I respect and honor that function. The problem occurs when he has higher ontic value because of his function when all of us had the same value before God. And I will always treat you on, based on your value before God and not just uh, honor those who have a function. Yeah. Are, you, are, you, yeah. are, are you with me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You ever seen somebody who will rush to speak to some, the bishop? but will won't even say a word. Yeah. Or when folk will value you based upon the size of your congregation yeah. rather than the depth and the power of your ministry and your person. Oh, all right. Mm -hmm. And if you aren't careful, you can be, you know, I, I, I pastor a, a rural, a, what was, was, well, it really was a rural church. It's now, you'd have to call it, what, suburban or exurban. Folk are child. When I went there, everybody there was a farmer 
or worked in Richmond, but we had, they had big farms. Now they've sold all those farms and their developments. <laughs> come on, come on. Amen. That's one of the reasons why around the church we've bought up 11 acres. If nothing else, we don't know what we're going to do with it, but we'll at least have the land. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, um, um, uh, but, 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 but the reality is, even in my own ministry, because my, my, the, the church where I'm privileged to pastor is comparatively what? What some would call what? A small church. Huh? And folk will say things like this. Someone of your caliber doesn't belong there. Hmm? And at first that used to pump me up. Yes, my caliber. <laughs> but then I begin to see what a travesty. Because if I ever start pastoring like I'm somewhere I don't belong, I will abuse and use the people I'm called to pastor. And I'm using them as a commodity to promote myself. I had to shift all of that around. And we aren't talking about the day, but a whole other model we've been talking about church growth. All churches ought to be growing. Even when you're not growing in numbers, you ought to be in a growth dynamic. You ought to be able to testify we're a growing church. Yeah. And we're so big, hallelujah. You won't see how we've grown, hallelujah. Yeah. Huh? But you got the same, you got the same footprint. No, we don't. We might have, we don't have more people, but we got greater ministry. And the people here have grown. <laughs> Come on, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. No. So, so I, I say I owe a great debt to the United Methodist Church. I grew up Methodist. I, I was formed in a Methodist church. It was those Sunday school teachers that, that poured into me. And I never realized, I, it just took me a long time to understand one of the biggest problems was, though, that our, minister, our pastors were more like itinerants. They would come and leave. You never developed a relationship with a pastor. I never had a pastor to mentor me. Mm -hmm. And can, can I just, be, as much as I was blessed, I didn't understand it. All of these huh, propitiations and things. I heard words that didn't didn't touch me where I was trying to live and the things that I was wrestling with. I grew up, I was an usher, and, you know, president of our youth group and all of that. Huh? But then, but guess what? I never joined the church. Can I tell you all this? I never joined the church. I was in the church by family relationship. And then when I went away to college, I left church altogether. Come on, y'all, I'm, I'm being real. I left and then, but there was a spirit in me. You understand? And so I, I start looking and seeking. I went to Catholic churches. I went to an Islamic center. Come on. Hmm? When I got back really focused on Christianity, it was the United Methodist Church that had a coffee house on the campus. Where we, I never went to the United Methodist Church, but I went to the coffee house where we could just talk about things. <coughs> you know, and get deep. Yeah. You see the spirit that bees, bees deep in you. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Somebody knows. Her. Come on. I'm talking about the flower season. <laughs> and you just want you to be deep. But eventually, the way I got back to the church was by the power of a church that had a powerful what? College ministry. And they sent a bus and picked us up. Amen. And one of the reasons I didn't go to church, because church lasted longer. And on Sundays, they stopped serving at 1 o'clock. I would miss my meals. So guess what? This church had what? Either served the meal of the church or hooked you up with a family. Where you got a good home-cooked meal every Sunday. Can I confess to you all? I did not go to church for Jesus. <laughs> Now, now, I hope this doesn't sound out of order. And the other thing is that brought me to that church were some young ladies. <laughs> Ted. <laughs> Tell it. Huh? Come on. Tell the truth. Amen. And it was this young lady that I was interested in, and her daddy was a deacon in the church. And, you know, when I went to see her, he said, now, are you going to be in church in the morning? And then she said, you know, my daddy's not going to let you come over here unless you... I start going to. 
I went to church. And guess what? That was my mistake, because I got hooked. <laughs> it came back and became real to me. And I literally was not baptized in the Baptist tradition until I was 21 years old. Within six months, I was acknowledging a call to ministry. And the pastor said, are you sure about this? And he let me struggle. He didn't do anything. He just kept saying, pray. I'll pray and you pray. And I was mad. You're supposed to be doing and then finally start talking. And as my, when I moved into my Sam's in my junior year, in my senior year, um, he said, now, if you are really committed to God, when you say yes to God, you say yes to preparation. He said, now, not everybody can go to seminary. You have the opportunity. You have, you have the ability. And I'm giving you the opportunity. If you commit to going to seminary, now, guess what? The tuition was $500. $500, and it was still a semester. And he said, if you commit to go to seminary, I want you to come back here once a year and preach, and we will pay your way to seminary. Hmm? Yeah, I preached. And so I literally was scholarship through seminary by what? A local church that would invest in me. And he just happened to be a Virginia Union graduate. And he said, do you think you're going to find yourself working in the church? Then there's only one place I want you to go. You go to Virginia Union. And the rest was history. And I eventually got a PhD and came back to be the dean of the school that I attended. And I just finished 27 years as a dean. And you all know that's unheard of in the academy. But guess what? One of the things I found, I've discovered, God not only calls you to ministry, he calls you to specific ministries. And I embraced my role as an academician as God's call on my life. Now, once I embraced it as God's call on my life, I could never meet or do anything that did not honor God. So when I talk to you, come on, All, huh? And so as the dean, guess what? I met with the annual conference and got, went to the university senate and got to school, what? Certified as a teaching seminary for United Methodists. Amen. And now you, I got a whole lot of United Methodists who will do what? Talk about their experience at a historically black school. And I tell them all the time, the reason that you can be of any culture and come is because the teaching methodology affirms that your story matters. Did you hear what I'm saying? Where you participate in the insurrection of subjugated knowledge, where the type of knowledge that has been viewed historically in the academy as lacking the appropriate specificity and scientificity to be used as a database for theological construction is now in rebellion. And that means you need to not only go to the library, you might need to have a conversation with your grandmother. Oh, come, no, do y'all, do y'all? So it means it's a, it's a teaching method that says, this, the, the books matter significantly, but also your story matters. Your journey matters, your pain matters, your struggle matters, your house matters. And that's very different when everything is where? Read this, pass that, move on. And people began to come and do what? Celebrate. And there were days where it was painful because we had to be honest with each other. How the toxicity of racism had affected all of us. It just wasn't about race as it related to people who were not black, but how racism, come on, had messed up. Mm -hmm. And I want to suggest to you that our theological systems are the foundations for racism. Yes, sir. All right. Now let's get into this sharing. Um, can you put up the design and destiny? Just this. I believe that your you know, we always talk about eschatology, your doctrine of the last things, and that comes at the end. It's your image of the future 
that controls how you live in the present. And I'll show you this. If the future we project is divided, guess what? Division now is legitimate because that's the fulfillment rather than the violation. No, did you, did you hear what I just said? So the way we've constructed the future is division and separation is eternally legitimated. Are y'all with me? We have just made God's fulfillment a condition of division where there are the in and the out. And anybody who doesn't go to my church is out. So therefore, I turn around and use my Christianity to create a benefit and privilege for me and a pain and exclusion for anybody else. I'm suggesting that that design is not affirmed in the destiny that we have created. What was the design? When God designed this, guess what? What? Everything was connected. Everything was in harmony. If you know, if you were in my class, I said there were four levels, Ted, there are four levels of connection. You're connected with God, you're connected with your true self, you're connected with your neighbor, and you're connected with the rest of creation. That's God's design. God's design is all about what? Oneness and connection. Hmm? That things are whole. When Jesus raises the question, will thou be made whole? Maybe he's saying, will you recover the authentic design of your existence? Do you want to stay broken? Or are you living into the fulfillment? Mm. And so the design is based upon harmony, harmony, mutuality. Now can, I, can, I give you, can I give you an example? In the beginning, were men and women in a hierarchical relationship in creation? Was that God's design? Then why are we teaching it in the church as this is God's design? There are many churches in America you can go to right now and religions around the world where they will say that the woman is an inferior being. We even have texts that we go to and say she is not in the image of God. Come on. She gets the image through her. So a woman by gender is necessarily a deficient lower class of being. That is fundamentally against God's design. And here's how, when I'm trying to teach this, I'll say, wait a minute. In creation was a man over a woman. That doesn't occur until when? The third chapter. Huh? That's a consequence of your sin, not a function of God's design. And my, if you read some of the articles, I was going to give you an article. It says, when you start making the function of the sin the design of God, you're not doing theology, you're doing snakeology. <laughs> you are allowing what the snake caused to dictate the character of your theological discourse. And what happens when we get drawn into that and we start preaching and teaching more snake than God? See, it, there was no hierarchy in creation. Now, you know, sometimes, you know, you know what, what sometimes we'll say as men? We'll say, but wait a minute. You don't understand. I realize the, the story that occurs first in Genesis, you don't realize that's actually not the oldest story. Because the second story is the oldest chronologically. It's just first sequentially. And I'll say, mm, maybe the Holy Spirit, when it was brooding over the composition of the Bible, said, put what you thought, what, what you're going to make second first. Because if, you don't, if I don't show you the second first, then you'll interpret the, 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 the second, huh? you'll, the first, like I don't want you to. <laughs> because then we'll say what? We'll say what? Well, Carla, you know, um, you know, well, I, it, it, it's no problem because, you see, God made me first and you're second. And so that creates a ranking and an order where God intended to me be first and you must always be second. But if you use that hermeneutic, stop and think with me. What was I made from? 
So in other words, the dirt is superior to me. <laughs> so I ought to be bowing to the dirt. And maybe if you want to have a creation-centered theology, we might need to start bowing to the soil. Oh, oh, we, we uh huh. That maybe the first creation is not you; it's the soil and the air and the water. And you've set up a hierarchy of value where you make the earth something to be commodified and objectified for your promotion and benefit when you ought to be honoring the earth because when you embrace any violation of the wholeness I attended, it brings death to the whole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look, look. So say, so come here. Okay, so that won't work. Then I'll, I ask this question. Is there a hierarchy of male and female in Christ? Show me. Show me anywhere where Jesus said, and when thou women thou shall be. So, but there weren't, any, there weren't any, any female disciples, are you sure? Did you read Luke 8 when it says, there were women of our company who ministered to me out of our substance? Uh -huh. Amen. And if a disciple is someone who has learned from the Lord and now speaks truth, hmm, the first preachers were women. You understand? So you, you can't use creation. You can't use Christ. Is there division of hierarchy between male and female in the Holy Spirit? No. It says the Spirit will be poured out upon what? Your men? Mm -hmm. Come on. Didn't it? And is there a hierarchy in heaven? When you get to glory, will men be over women? So in every place of God's self primary, primordial self-disclosive activity that we affirm as Christians in creation, in Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the coming consummation, there is no hierarchy. Then why do we teach it in the church? Well, God has an order, and you have to be in your place. Mm -hmm. <coughs> And that's whenever black folk begin to claim their own dignity and become self-defining. Guess what they used to say? You're getting uppity. You're getting out of your place. And the place is designed by a social worldly hierarchy and not the design of God. And then the church start teaching the hierarchy as God's design. And then you educate people into demonic possession. Just, just wrestle with me. Come on, stay, stay with me. No, no, work with me. So here's the design. You see the design? Uh, what, time, what time is it? Who's my timekeeper? 10.53. We'll stop at 12. Oh, no, no, we'll stop. We'll eat. And then I'll, this afternoon I'll do a part three of it, three, two or three things. And I want to leave time for plenty of questions. Please, I'm not an expert. I'm not right. I'm wrestling. And the only way I can be better is that you all wrestle with me. Okay? I'm not here to tell you what's right. I'm here to tell you about my own struggles. Can I just say this? People always say, well, you know, black folk didn't have a theology. That's absurd. <laughs> now, look, look, can I show you this? Theology is birthed in crisis. Comfortable people recite creeds. Hurting people construct theology. You see, there has to be existential or cognitive dissonance between your reality and the creed that causes you to say, wait a minute. If I say I believe in God, the creator of heaven and earth, I say, God, if you made this thing, why am I going through what am I going? Come on. Do you understand what I'm saying? I don't have the luxury of being anti-theological and being a believer because too much of my existence contradicts what I say I believe. So i got to raise theological questions. How long, God? Yeah. When, God? Where, God? How, God? Because if I don't raise these questions, I'm going to go crazy or and I'm going to walk away from the church. It's only when I start wrestling with God. Tomorrow, you all, I get to go to Detroit and meet with a group up there. And one of the things I'm trying to help them understand there is don't lose your holler. And I'm going to talk about the power of holler 
as an act of courageous confrontation with the negative existence. And when you lose your holler, you have surrendered to the powers and let them define you. But when you reach the point that in the midst of the deepest pain, you can celebrate and have joy and say hallelujah, that is not passive, illusionary, dismissal of your reality. It's my confrontation with my reality and telling you, you think you got the power, but you don't. Hallelujah! <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> no, no, no. Come on. Say. See, do you see God's design? Do any of us start saying, and God designed division. God designed this. Okay. Now, I know I don't want to be, I don't, I, I, I'm not going to be apolitical, but I don't want. But see, when someone tells you they're trying to take your religion, if your religion is based upon division, I'm trying to take it. I'm trying to bring that down because as long as we're doing that, it'll bring death to all of us. We will have no peace because we're... remember when Jesus said, and the first shall be last and the last shall be first? Guess how we have done, even in liberation theology where we mess up, guess what liberation means? Hmm? Sisters, Sometimes when sisters discover their authenticity, they, well, no, when they, when they are trying to embrace their authenticity, guess what they say? Yeah. You didn't put me down long enough. <laughs> now, anybody who knows anything about personal transformation development, there's a necessary stage in your development called anger. Because if you won't get angry, you won't get healed. <laughs> At some point, you ought to get angry and say, wait a minute. Because you have to confront what's been done to you. But you know what the deepest pain is? Is when you start confronting what you've done to yourself. Yeah. How you have been a co-conspirator in your own yeah. violation yeah. while you were saying yes. And that's why feminists and womanist writers say the sin of the woman is not the pride and arrogance, but self-negation and abnegation that you've never really claimed your own center. I'm going to show you in a minute where I believe that's the fundamental sin. Throughout the tradition, we thought taught that sin was the cause of you sin because you've lost sight of your true dignity and you need something external to yourself to find legitimation. It's just, come on, come on. Let's just throw this out. All right, look, look. Design, destiny. You got that? We're whole. If we could just all get back to we were in creation, guess what? We wouldn't have the drama we got. Huh? We'd all be hooked up to God. Can I say that? We wouldn't even have religions. We'd have a relationship. This thing. Religion is made necessary by our failure. Not by our fruitfulness. <laughs> Work with me. Look, 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 look. So we were whole, all right? So guess what happens in the whole? How do we get messed up? Let's look at point two. Go. Go. Boom. Deception. In a free moral universe, there are always those elements that invite your participation in that which is alien to God's intent, desire, decree, and design. No, no, there's always something coming at you that says what? Go here. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, this is what will make everything all right. This is what you do. And in the deception... Symbolize, to see, the snake represents that embodied aspect of a free moral universe which is inviting your participation in that which is alien to God's intent, desire, decree, and design for your life. Guess what? Guess what I just found out? Devils can wear blue jeans. <laughs> Snakes can preach. But if their purpose is to draw you in to either behavior, thought, action, or relationship that violates God's intent, desire, and decree, and design for you, that's snakish. And that's what the snake does. Now look, see, even, you look at the whole concept of what, he's a liar. 
But he lies for a purpose. Now look, he tells two lies in the beginning, the snake. The first lie is about God. And the second lie is about you. The first lie is, let me just interpret, God is threatened by you and he doesn't want you to know something. God will never withhold any good thing from you. God is not a threatened God. Have you ever seen a threatened leader? Come on. Yeah, yeah. And when you start living with threats, come on, you got to make all kind of lies. You do stuff to what? Because you're threatened. And so guess what? I want everybody to be beneath me. Amen. I want to be great. And in order for me to be great, you got to be less. And we will make a world not that's great again, but we have more or less again. Let's make more or less again. Let's make sure that nobody else is coming together in community. Let's make sure that our rubrics are not violated. Let's make sure. And so he tells a lie. He says, God is threatened by you. God is scared of you. And God wants to keep you down. And he wants you to stay in your place. Come on. So that you will not think you. Look, it's the first instance in scripture for me. I'm, this, I'm doing this as a theologian, okay? Where the God who was with you now becomes the God who is above you and wants you where? So you institute a hierarchy that is a function of God's nature and design. Where throughout the story, what does it say? It does not use under and over descriptions. It's the and, coordination and connection, or what? With. We walked with God. But now, where is God? Where are you? Now, we won't give up this design. Why? We have designed the earth this way. And if I have to give up an over God, I have to give up my over position. I got to make sure God remains over because then God is sanctioning the way I operate. I'll, I'll say this and I say it all the time. Once you get privilege from a lie, you do not want truth. You want lies that preserve your privilege. You know what I'm saying? I won't, don't bring me truth. Bring me a lie that preserves my privilege because I love my privilege more than I love truth. So the enemy, my enemy is anything that threatens my privilege. Uh-oh. So what I do is cause you to live in fear that somebody's going to take your privilege. And you end up supporting the liar because they are promising you your, the maintenance of your privilege. Mm. So, the deception, or what might be called the demonic, is constantly creating two lies. One, God is over you. And if you ask anybody, most people in the church, where is God, guess what they're going to say? Hmm? Anytime you think you're in charge, where are you? So, the pastor is over the bishop is over this, then the, come on, huh, the local is over this, and you over, over that, over that. And then people live not to give themselves to God, but to move up in the hierarchy. Can I, can I give you an example? Once this demonic reality, it begins to enter us, we literally begin to value people based upon their position in the hierarchy rather than the depth of their person. And if I'm in charge, guess what I, guess I want to say, say to you? Even as a teacher, guess what I say? You see all these people here? They were under me. Yeah, they were in my class. They were under me. And you know, some of them are doing pretty great things, and they wouldn't have done a thing unless they would have been under me. And if you haven't been under Dr. Kenny, you don't really know. <laughs> Come 
on. Do you, do you, you understand what I'm Just look at how we talk. It's a, it is hierarchically freighted language that we don't even know how to honor any, anything without saying who's under who. Now, so first of all, God is there. And guess what? Now you understand why Jesus is Emmanuel, God with you. And his promise is, I will be with you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Huh? Because we went from with, and guess what the church is teaching? Men over women, black over white, or white over black, come on. North over south, amen, come on. Amen. And I maintain my power by creating fear so that you make sure that you live to make sure somebody else doesn't get with you, but you can stay over them. I don't even want black and brown people to unite. Come on. I don't want anybody. I don't want to get together. Huh? I don't want an African-American Baptist talking to Methodists. Oh, maybe he's acceptable. At least he grew up in the Methodist church. And he can say that his, his great-great-grandmother was, uh, shall we say, a winch of the master. The deception. The deception is... That we don't live like this. You live like God is threatened. And then guess what? What's the next lie? It's a lie about you. Look at it. He gets more or less tells you, you're not in the image of God. You ain't much. Come on. You don't mount to anything. God is threatened by you, and you ain't much. But guess what? If you really want to be somebody, it's not what God has put in you. It's out there. Get it. And in my argument, I say that we move from being fruit bearers to fruit takers. And we live our lives rather than giving, taking. What can I get? Yes. Amen. So what I'll say to you, even, even if I'm on a relationship, you know, guess what I'm saying? What's in it for me? Hmm? Are y'all okay if I, if I get real? Because I'm, you know, I, I, I'm real in the church. Come on. Because I'll even, I'll t you know, I'm working with my young men. I'll say, they don't even ask you did, you, did you care for her? The question is, did you get it? That I even view the most intimate moments as a moment of getting rather than a moment of mutual offering. And just last week I did a thing as in, and your body becomes weaponized because you use your sexuality as an instrument of conquer. Oh, oh. that was in another kind of setting. I wasn't in a sanctuary, I was in it. <laughs> No, 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 come, come, come on, just look. Do you see it? Look, 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 here it is. Look, look, look. Here's God, right? The deception says, uh-uh, God is up there, and you ain't much. Now, let me tell you how you can become somebody. Get that. And now you are judged based upon what you get, not why what you give. Look, look, you see we went from bearing to and God does not the word does not say and you shall be known by how many fruits you pluck <laughs> you will be known by the fruit you bear oh. Oh, oh, oh come on now and the other lie you know what it is it's about you it's about guess what he lied he lies and guess what he says to you you ain't much you ain't nobody. It sets up a deficiency model in your theological anthropology that makes you a deficient being who needs something else in order to be of any worth. 
Oh, no, come on, come on. And you start believing that lie and you spend your, all your life trying to be somebody rather than live into the fullness of the being you are. And somebody else is always telling you, you're not this, you're not that. Come on. And your whole self-image is being destroyed and beaten down. Amen. And you'll spend billions of dollars trying to look like what somebody else told you to look like. Come on. And you always, you live your life with shame rather than celebration. Can I make it real, real plain? The people come to church and they're so psychically wounded, they shout when you tell them they're a worm. You're a wretch and a worm. Rather than them hearing the words, you are a child of God. Your name is written in the hand of God. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Amen. God is love. God does not show love. God is love. And your reality does not define the character of God. God's going to be who God is even when you ain't who you ought to be. God loves you. And don't join the church to convince God to love you. Join because you recognize you are loved, not to become loved. And we don't love you after you join. We love you right now. Can I give you an example in terms of sermonically? Guess what? The woman, huh, with the lost coin. I always try to help folk to see this. Guess what? The woman, had, the coin is valuable even when it's lost. The lost condition does not alter the value of the coin. And the woman, you the reason you're going after the coin is not because they need you. You need your treasury is deficient because you know there's a value that's not presently all oh, in relationship. See, and if you if, if you want to use a woman as hermeneutic, guess what the text just told you? A woman, this was a woman who had her own house, her own money, and could throw her own party. Oh, no, y'all didn't miss me. Because she said when she found it, she had a party. Come on. So, brother, if all you got is a house, money, and a party, I can do that all by myself. You got to come, you got to come stronger. You got to come stronger than that. No, no, no. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> that's when I'd be bad. But this, this is the way I do. I'm, see, after, after, after you've been with somewhere 43 years, I get to be crazy, y'all. I tell the young, some of the young folk, don't y'all ever try to preach this? And I'll show you in a minute. Why? Because you, you don't have the relationship. You haven't matured in a relationship with the people that you can have these type of conversations. You know? But guess what? So it's there. But when you put it on the other side, it's just simply, these are all models of evangelism. And you can never reach folk until you recognize they have value. And the passion for your reaching them is because you recognize you're deficient, not them. A dirty coin is, as, is just as valuable as a clean one. Hmm? Now, can I show y'all something else? This is just for sermonic purposes. What did she have to do to find the coin? She had to light a candle and sweep. Guess what the text just told you? The reason the coins are being lost is because you got too much dark and dirt and darkness in the church. Oh, no, come on, y'all miss me. See, 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 the reason the coin was lost because you had too much dirt and darkness in your house. And if you want to find some more coins, maybe you need to do something about the dirt and darkness in your own house. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Oh. All right, isn't this fun, y'all? <laughs> now look, come on, come on. Do, do you see it? The deception. Did mine. Now, the other one, he lies about you. You're not worth much. Now, see, what you got to realize, he doesn't appeal your pride. He, appeal, he appeals to creating a sense of self-negation. Amen. He puts you in the position of vulnerability where you start feeling like you have no value and your value is created by accessing something outside of yourself, looking like somebody else, acting like somebody else. Come on. He lies. Amen. He lies. And we teach and preach the lie. Now, I'm not talking about some of this stuff. You know, I, 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 get, I get kind of, uh, I'll be honest, I get kind of aggravated by a lot of the preaching that I see on TV. And I'm not a great preacher, y'all. I'm, I'm, I'm called to be a teacher. And I love to talk to preachers. I like to give them stuff that they can think about. Wow. I never saw that. Amen. 
See, you take that same chapter when they say, what's the lost chapter in the Bible? Well, that's a Bible trivia question. Guess what the answer is? The 15th chapter of Luke. A lost coin, a lost sheep, and a lost son. It's the lost chapter. So you can do a series of sermons on the lost chapter in the Bible. Come on. Amen. And look at these lessons of how they went after the lost. Amen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. But you know, like the prodigal son, it always says there was a famine in the land. Wait a minute. Where was the man working? Huh? What was he? Where did the man, that, the, the, the son that left, where did he end up working? In a pig pen. What was he doing? Feeding the pigs. And it says they were feeding him stocks or what? Feeding, literally the word there is pods. He was feeding them bean, bean pods. Wait a minute, y'all. You all ever go to Japanese, you know, where there's, there's scarcity of food? The pods will be on your plate. When you don't have food, you eat the pods. Huh? And if you got the pod, it means you had a whole lot of beans. You got a pig and bean. You got pork and beans. <laughs> Can I make it plain for you? Ain't a single black person on the face of the earth gonna starve when you got pork and beef. <laughs> so where is some deeper meaning I might people understand? Is the famine about food? Or is it a famine of the presence of anyone who will give anything to you? Remember, they took everything he had, but I remember a father who gave. He's living in a world of takers. But I know where a giver is. Let me go home to the giver. I've been taken my whole life. And everywhere I turned to find meaning, I got taken. But I know somebody who gave to me. I think I'll go home. <laughs> I'm starving for a presence that does not use me. Hmm. Can I tell you something? My experience with young people today, I got a whole lot of young folk, y'all. They just don't come to church. <laughs> but they love their church. They love their God, and they love their pastor. If I, if, I, if I call them and say, I need y'all to do this, boom. Amen. They're going to be right there. And I don't beat them up for coming. So if there's only a handful of them there, I'll stop in the middle of a sermon. I say, y'all, come on, somebody, I want y'all to tweet that right now. Come on. I want y'all to put it out there right now. To go, take all your friends, get them, tell them, pastor just said this, and they need, it, they, they need to hear it. When I, for a few years ago, guess what I was saying? Put them phones down. Get that stuff out. We don't need all that. Come on, am I the only one? <laughs> when in fact, now, guess what I do? I use it. Y'all help me spread the gospel right now. Huh? If that made you celebrate that much, somebody else needs to celebrate. I want you to right now text 10 people. I don't want you to slap hands with 10 people here. They heard it. <laughs> no, no, come on, come on. Because there's it's something else I want to tell you. Learning ought to be a joy. When you get together and learn, there ought to be just kind of celebration. Even though you cry sometimes, you struggle sometimes, you differ sometimes. But there ought to be a sense of celebration. What a privilege. Don't you think some of those Kurds right now would like to be able to sit with no bomb bursting and be able to talk about God? And what's in the name of God do you call him, Jehovah or Allah? Huh? Wouldn't they love to have for the privilege that we have here right now? Hallelujah. And then how can I come and study and be miserable hmm. when the opportunity to study is a sign of just how blessed I am? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, so... So the, the other thing is what? God is up there and you're down here. Let me give you an example of another sermon I preached um, a couple years ago. Guess what the title was? I serve a low-down God. <laughs> Come on. See, most of us serve a what? And we'll say things like this. He sits high. Come on. It's a, and he looks low. 
And we'll say, hallelujah. Ain't that right? But if all he does is sit high and look low, he's no different than the priest on Jericho Road. I walk by, look at you, and keep going. I don't serve a God who sits high and looks low. I serve a God who came low. Come on. Who gets low. I got a low down God. Huh? <laughs> Amen. I serve a low down God. You know why? And I, I'm, I'm glad about it. You know why? Because when he found me, I was low down. Y'all didn't hear me. Yeah, come here. Come yeah, here. Yeah. See, I'm so glad he inhabits low down spaces. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's low down. He's so low down if you make your bed in hell. Even there, he will be what? With you. Y'all didn't hear me. He won't. He, guess what? I'm a low down God. And then guess what your Christological co conclusion is? I know he's a low down God. Because he came down through 40 and two generations of time. Come on. Walked the dusty streets of Palestine. 30 and three years. Hung, bled, and died on a tree of torch. Come on. Hmm? And guess what? Then he got up early one morning. Yeah. And he went up set, and guess what? But he went up so he could get low down. Yeah. <laughs> I serve a low down God. And see, a low down God is intimately present with you. That high up God is what? And here's, here's what we do in the church, particularly when we're the preacher. I'm high up, you know. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now turn to page. <laughs> All right, God bless you. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> no, but I just do that illustratively. Y'all remember that story was told about the young preacher that went to seminary, got his degree, huh? And when he went in, he was going to candidate for a church, went into church. And stood up, you know, walked down the aisle. Got up there and preached and flunked flat on his face. Mm. And then we came from the pulpit, he walked out of the church like that. And one of the mothers grabbed him and said, son, can I give you some advice? If you would have went up there like you came down from there. Then you could have come down from there the way you went up there. No, 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 no. <laughs> this, this sense of humility. But again, see, see, we got to up God, and we think serving God means the tragic thing, even like something like Matthew 25, we don't see that as God elevating or collapsing the hierarchy between the poor, the prisoner, and the sick. We see it as our call to charity. So we use the victim as a way of patting ourselves on the back for being good Christians. When in fact what he just said was, when you see them, never see their condition, see me. What you did unto the least of them. You did unto me. So never treat them like they're the least again. You got, you, you got, you got, are you with me? All right, put, put the next one up there. Okay, you see what, what's up there? Division, hmm? that's three. And number four is, um, uh, yeah, and this is number, th yeah, distortion and darkness. You see this? So if we look at, look at the division, the division literally leads to dehumanization and death. This is where, now, we got, set, see, the end result is what? Everything that was together gets what? Where is God? Where are you? Where were you in the creation? Come on. Then you get separated from your true self. Look at this. When you were with God, you were naked and not ashamed. After you got separated from God, guess what you did? You made your own body something nasty rather than a gift to glorify God. Guess what we still teach in the church? And many people in the church grow up never getting in touch with the dignity, beauty, and authenticity of sexuality. 
I know I'm in a sanctuary, but I'm going to be real. It, when we particularly do a trip on women, because women are supposed to be what? Pure and chaste. And, no, no. Uh -huh. And guess what we were taught, men? I won't ask Don. Don, no, no. Guess what? You must marry a good girl, but if you don't ever have fun, have a bad one. Y'all didn't hear that? Guess what you just told us? Guess what? So, so a Christian woman has no passion. <laughs> but see, that's what we're doing. Why? Because, because we even make it her responsibility to keep us good. And we even suggest that her primary purpose is biological and she is by birth a temptress. And they disrupt spiritual flow because they call us away from the spirit to the embodied. I mean, it's literally, you, come on, you all read the history of theology, come on. But do you understand, you understand what I'm saying? You start, now look, when they did, he said, I'm naked. What did God say? Who told you? We don't read that and say, wait a minute, God just told us something. That our present understanding of our bodies is not derived from God. We're getting it from somewhere else. God could also say this, where'd you get that from? And we are teaching in the church what didn't come from God is God's design. Nasty. And that breaks you. It separates you. And you see, and we get in, come on, we, get, we divide even things like what? Intellect and emotion. I said that earlier. Emotional people must be ignorant. Because if truly intellectual, you will, yes. Let me give you an extended analysis of this pericope and afford you the privilege of engaging the insight about the Christological construct as it relates to your personal salvation. Uh, let's look at this text, y'all, and let's see. <laughs> uh -huh. Now, there's some context. You, you have to do it that way in order for them to even begin to hear you. Mm -hmm. But what, all I'm saying on the other side is, why is it? Isn't it amazing how Jesus took complex things and made them so simple? We think it's our job to take simple things and make it complex. And people, I don't know if you experienced this as a professor. I'm sure you did. You know. Guess what? Folk will say, wow, he's deep. I didn't understand a word he said. <laughs> How can you be deep when you can't communicate? Can I tell you all in my own experience how, what hit me in the face? Um, when, I was, um, when I was studying, um, I got so deep that I was going to, I joined with some of my friends. I had some buddies, and we all going to get together in January. We, 50 years ago, we're still getting together. To, as they're all pastors, just getting together and just to hang out for a while and tell lies. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I went to right here in Richmond, Virginia, Mount Tur Tabor Baptist Church. What's on? What, what street is that on? Fairmont. Fairmont, yeah. So we formed this little group, huh? Called Blackenizing the Black Church. Oh, black. Huh? Yeah. We're gonna get them. See, y'all ain't black. See, I'm reading all this stuff about liberation theology. Come on, y'all. So I'm Ted and I'm going, you know, going, hey, amen. Go black, black. Black, 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 you know, just, just an Afrocentrist, you wouldn't even be talked about that much. He said, black, yeah, yeah, black, black, and I got super black. <laughs> come on, come on. Because my complexion, I had to make sure, folks, I was super black. <laughs> 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 I got super black, and I was a theologian in the group. And I'm up there, and I'm, I'm talking, so we're at this church. Uh, um, what was the guy? Oh, my God, what was his name? A oh, long time ago, he taught Old Testament. What was his name? I can't remember his name. I'll leave it. And so we sue when we're going, see, the black church not being black no more. You being this and you got to get, get black. Y'all losing the sight because y'all got all this other worldly stuff you're in denial. And Karl Marx said and Forbach said and blah, 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 blah. Have you ever been somewhere and you're speaking and you all into it and then folks start looking at you funny? <laughs> and then the next stage is they start looking at each other. <laughs> Huh? Then when it gets real bad, they start turning kind of sideways in their seats. Huh? 
And these folks, and the more they seem to resist, guess what I did? See, that's what's wrong with you right now. You're not bad. <laughs> Come on. So in the end, the pastor said, we want to thank these young men for coming out here tonight. Um, but I don't know about you all, but I feel a need for prayer. <laughs> And uh, one of the deacons got up and prayed, and there was a radical shift in the character of the engagement. And he said, this evening, my heavenly Father, I thank you that you brought me through another day. I thank you that you've let me see the westering sun and you bless me to be my C and I around every blind curve. You kept back hurt and danger while my golden moments just to roll on a little while longer. And he began, and when he started praying, guess what? Mm. It, pray! Thank you, Jesus. Pray! Hallelujah! Thank you! Thank you. While he's praying, I'm getting mad. And, and he, you know, he had a, par a paradigmatic conclusion. And Lord, uh, when I'm through with my trip across the sands of time and I leave my footprints behind, when I put my foot by the River Jordan, St. Peter comes sailing by and bids me to get on board. And Lord... Please grant that I'll sail across the storm-tossed waters of life, dock at the continent of eternity, and walk down the gangplank of salvation. <laughs> and just as soon as my feet strike Zion, I'll praise them. Come on. And by this time, what? And then he, before he finished, he said, And Lord, Lord, uh, Fugerbaki, I don't know. <laughs> Marks, I don't know, but there's a name I know, and I ain't heard him all night long. <laughs> Jesus, oh Jesus, Jesus, and by this time what? Pandemonium in the place. Come on, y'all. I'm mad. Look at this thing. We got this fifth grade educated deacon. I'm a graduate with student. They shouting for that ignorance and not about me. And a lady, God bless the mothers. You hear me? God bless the mothers. God bless the mothers. Thank you, mama. Thank you. I'm talking about the women in the church who care for you. When they old and will advise. She walked up to me, Neil, and she put her hand right here on my stomach and she said, son, I see your pain. Mm. And she said, son, I also see God does have a fountain bubbling in you. Wow. Wow. But son, I need to help you right now. Yep. If you want us to drink from your fountain, mm. you better bring the water in a cup we recognize. Took me about five or more years. It went right over my head. <laughs> no, seriously, come on. But I begin to understand, guess what? You're here teaching us and trampling on us because you're more committed to what you think you know than to us growing. You're wounding us when we thought you were coming to be with us. How do you preach when the way you stand appears that you want a wound? And so you see the dehumanization, the division. Everywhere we were together, what? Where's God? What are you? The man and the woman that is where the two shall be one. Now what are you doing? And guess what? You just sang hallelujah, God, for this gift. Now you're saying, this woman you gave me. 
you just hadn't done this, God, everything would have been all right. It's messed up now. When God told you the mess was not her, the mess was when you were alone. Oh. Come on, he made everything. He said it was good until he made a human being alone. And he said it's not good. When he created her, he said it's very good. Oh. Now, women, don't y'all say, yeah, I've been trying to tell. <laughs> no. The theological principle is what? You are not made for isolation and you cannot maximize your promise or your possibility inherent in your design when you function in isolation. You are made for relationship. You need somebody. You need the rest of this because I made you whole. I didn't make you broken. I found you function in relationship. But it's not just about marriage. Huh? Pastors, do we have some friends that we can trust? Come on. You can't do this in isolation. It's not good that you be alone. And that's why, guess what? Until, guess what, can I say this? That's why the woman was not attacked because she was weak. Demons don't attack the weak. The only reason you get attacked is because your existence has the capacity to disrupt the design of the demonic. Demons don't attack folk who ain't can't do nothing. Amen. Can I say this? I get in trouble. If you have never found your ministry under attack, it's not because you're favored, it's because you're trifling. <laughs> Seriously, stuff will come. And that's why you need each other. Why? We got to walk through this together because I got some stuff. Hmm? In, in Detroit, I'm going to be talking to them about, guess what? You can call down fire on the mountain and have a high day in the Lord, and the next day you can meet a Jezebel Huh? Or a Michael. Come on. And guess what? You can do great things in your ministry, and all it takes is one influential person to cause you to go to a pit of pity and start wishing you weren't in the ministry. And God has to come and minister you. And see, people always say he went from the mountain to the valley. No, his, his pit became his highest mountain. Because it was there, he met God on another level. And so, so this, all gets, this all gets twisted, messed up, and now we're divided. Huh? And what we do every time we get together, we're going to talk about our divisions. Well, you're a Democrat, I'm a Republican. Amen. You're United Methodist, I'm Baptist. I'm Baptist, you're Pentecostal. And we don't have any of them. And the minute you start talk, talk, talking about getting together, do you sure you want to bring those kind? No, seriously, do you? Is a dean when I say, well, we're going to have a relationship with Pente a lot of Pentecostals need a seminary too. Oh, are you sure you want to bring those kind of people? You know, they don't like education like you do. No. <laughs> no, no. All right. All right. I'm being bad. I'm being bad. I must be. I need, must need a break. I'm getting delirious. Help me a little. <laughs> no, no. But do you, do, you, do you see it? Now, what I want you to begin to think about, though, how this begins to affect your preaching to the degree that you may be preaching the disruption of the design, or what? And affirming the deception and encouraging division. And we cannot grow the church with the same lie. Oh, come on, you understand? And you will guess what's happening? There are young people who aren't even church who can recognize the lie. They're saying, don't be bringing home, huh? what? I'm gonna get in real trouble when I say this. You're going to tell me that somebody who doesn't sleep like you can't be a child of God? And they'll tell you in a minute. Forget that. Take all that and y'all go ahead and do what y'all do. Huh? And I'm going to go somewhere. Huh? There's you know, an article years, a few years ago that says, uh, I will take Jesus and leave the church. I mean, these are the type of questions they're raising. And for me, the ultimate standard is, does it reveal the character of a loving God and a God? Hmm? Isn't it amazing how dysfunctional we can become because we will deny people hmm, 
based upon our opinions rather than even in stopping and say, you know what, if nothing else, and we need to really stop and think and pray about this. Oh, God, I need to t spend time with you, God, because I fundamentally recognize in my gut something ain't right. And I need to really stop and start thinking about where are you in this, God? I need to study my word, begin to understand why some of the things that are in word are there, but how much of the word does it communicate the nature that I see when I experience you? In the black church, in the black, black folk, a lot of times black folk, we say they're not, they weren't literate, they were literate, they just didn't speak English. You see, we think anybody who doesn't speak my language is illiterate. They might be genius and have excellent reading and writing skills. They just don't speak your language. And a lot of black folk couldn't, did not read the Bible, huh? but they were very literate. And see, when the Bible was first introduced to us, I, I always, when you read the folklore, even after that, like some of the, key, when the kids got to go to college or study and, they, and, and you didn't, do you, do you ever ask the question, if these slaves were so ignorant and were incapable of learning, then why did you pass laws so they couldn't read? If they're incapable of learning, you don't need a law to prevent it. Somewhere there's some incongruence in the way you... <laughs> no, no. Uh, very quickly, let me look here. Oh, we're great. Here. Uh, look, that, that, that if, we, if we begin to, uh, to think about some of these things and begin to be open to what God may be doing in our midst. And the bottom line is, Guess what, y'all? I have finally matured enough. I ain't got to be right. And I invite the congregation I lead. Let's grow together. Let's be honest about our pains, our hurts, our confusion, and doubt. Can I just share this with you? Our church is going to have to deal with this because I had a young, very gifted, talented young lady in our church who lives now in Northern Virginia and she is getting married to her partner. And now the church is saying, Pastor, how do you feel about that? And the family is divided. The grandmother won't go. Now the son is upset with his grandmother, his mother, because she won't be present. I can't sanction sin. Well, you went to so-and-so's wedding, and they've been living together for 20 years before. No. Yes. Uh, you know, I, and, and so they asked me, and I got to deal with it. And I, you know what? I was so glad. Uh, uh, my wife told me yesterday, she said, John, I know I have no business speaking for you, but when they came and asked me, they didn't want to ask you. They wanted to know how you feel. I told them, you all have a loving pastor, and anything that he says or does will be an act of love that models the God he serves. Oh. I said, say that again, baby. Come on one more time. <laughs> All right, y'all got these first three points? And you see how, now, very quickly, I got about 11.45, right? Okay. Any question or comment. And again, don't, don't, it's not to say right or wrong, but can we honestly begin to think? Because you know what my concern is? Because we have not examined our theology, we're preaching stuff that is wounding, hurting, and literally sounding the death knell of the church. Because there's a generation rising. They ain't stuck on Augustine. And guess what? They are more incarnationally focused than ideational focused. What do I mean by this? How is our faith embodied? Not how we debate all these theological points. You can have all that, but tell us how we're going to live together. How are we going to live? How are we going to be church? Not what doctrine we're going to pronounce. Now, they're not totally separate. But you got to hear that. 
And my argument is I had to learn to be with them before I preached to them. Now I just, I just love God and I love people. And guess what? I love you and I love the fact that we're going to stop and eat. Now, <laughs> any, any quick question? Any quick question or comment or y'all going to save them to this afternoon after you talk around the table and get it straight, okay? <laughs> huh? We got the mic so that yeah. after this set he's going to do that. So okay. So wow. That's a question. Come on. Question. Yes. Yeah, it's on. I appreciate you uh, talking about deception, talking about uh, being left out, talking about how we um, have misconstrued the relational piece. And I heard echoes in my mind of an issue that's that's getting ready to split the United Methodist Church, mm -hmm. and that's human sexuality. And I have some, some young people that come to me and they talk. And I'm renewed by their, their willingness to live together and be together. But they're not interested in being a part of my congregation. And initially, I had a problem with that. But now I understand. So a question would be, how do we begin to breach that divide so that we are nurturing a, an environment where we welcome them? I hate to say into our dysfunction, but <laughs> into our dysfunction. Yes. Well. I don't want to welcome them into our dysfunction. I want to welcome them into our dynamic community. Where dysfunction may be a dimension of our dynamism, but it will never define us. Because we're so dynamic that we're always pursuing a deeper relationship with God. And I think for me, what uh, I would say, uh, how I try to deal with them is, um, again, to let them see the faith, to see how the God that I believe, affirm, and celebrate, the God that I believe has its primordial revelation in a historical figure. And just like the word became flesh in him, may the word become flesh in me. So they don't hear words they experience the word in the flesh. Where they more or less say, you know, I disagree with pastor. Can't, no, I disagree with him. Yeah. But I know he loves me. I know pastor cares about me. One of the things I teach that every principle that God has given you is not tend to restrict you, limit you, or deny you. God doesn't give laws to deny you. God gives principles so that you can maximize the fullness of the possibility that exists in you. If God didn't give you principles, he would be a co-conspirator in your pain. And God says, I want you to experience the fullness of the possibilities that exist in you. And therefore, I warn you, don't do this. But here's, I believe, the mistake that we've made. We have made dysfunction the defining characteristics we have because people have abused sex now we make sex bad in other words oh we don't, we don't talk no, we don't have that don't, don't, don't talk about that in the church don't bring, do you know they were in church school talking about sex my god what are we going to do about this that should be done in the home not in no there's certain things you can teach them about their bodies the gift of their sexuality, that you can teach them about the beauty, huh? and that the appropriation of your body is given to you, God, to God for joy. Huh? And there are ways in which you can, whenever you dishonor God, you dishonor yourself. 
Because God has not given you anything to hurt you. Everything God has given is to help you and to maximize your possibility. And just like that God, I speak to you because I want to max be a partner in maximizing your possibility. Can you tell? And guess what? Every chance I get, rather than criticize them, express gratitude to them. Thank you for trusting me enough that you'll have this conversation. Thank you for the moments that you have participated in the life of this church, even though it's only been three Sundays in the last three months. It was so good to see you. Your presence brings life to us. And I want to thank you for your faithfulness. Do y'all, yeah. you'd be amazed. Hmm? What they do. So guess what? Anytime they're having a problem with dating, Y'all help me. I have a young lady that's one of the lead singers in my, we'll call the Anointed Voices. There's some young women who, got, who used to sing with their, they, we had a young adult choir, and they said, our, our parents are in that choir. <laughs> we don't want to sing with them. And I said, let's make room for your gift then. And they sang, right? One of them, who is 29, just gave birth to a baby, and she's not married. She came to me and said, Pastor, I'm going to have a baby. My clock is ticking. And I want to be a birth mother. I'm going to have a baby. You understand? And of course what? The church, oh Lord, one of our leading ladies is having a baby? What do you do with that? What do y'all do? What do you do with that? Oh, she's out of wedlock. My word. Praise God. Hmm? She's no, no, can I be honest with you? You're looking at her. I'm looking over here. Come on, can I say this? With some of my ministers, before they even came to the Lord, fathered three, three children out of wedlock, and now they're anointed bishops. But she's not fit to sing in your choir. I, you believe these are the things I, I wrestle with. Do you know, I, years ago I did a, did a thing, I can remember this right now, and it was a group, and guess what? In the group, guess what? They, once you get a divorce, you're put out. Because you can't be divorced, right? And they got the text, getting divorced. I said, can I ask you all a question? Will you all accept someone who committed the crime of murder? And God blesses them. You all up here crying and saying praise the Lord. How God turned this person's life around. And now they're a preacher. You will accept them. But you will not accept the divorcee. And I told the group y'all plum praise. I said here's my advice to you. If divorce is a potentiality in your relationship. Don't divorce them. Kill them. <laughs> <laughs> because if you kill them. You can still be in the group, but if you do. <laughs> and see, I don't, I'm, 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 you know, you, you know, that's one of the, age gives you privilege, because I don't just, you know, I really, you know, amen. I, and I'm also privileged because I'm not dean anymore. A lot of things I'm, as dean, I would not say because I put the reputation of the institution at stake. And so I was obligated. Huh? To honor the institutions that I was leading. Amen. But now that I'm not the leader anymore, you're going to hear more <laughs> of the crazy man. <laughs> hey, hey, man. Come on, any other question before we break? Thank you. And I didn't answer it, and I didn't intend to answer it. Because that's, that's, that's something we're all wrestling with. And here's what I firmly believe. There are some things that nobody else can give you the answer because the answer gives you the license to be irresponsible because it's not a product of your own walk with God. So, Dean, I guess I'm not going to get an answer either. Um, the question for me is, even when the pastor is welcoming and most of the people are wel welcoming, yes. there's a faction of yes. people mm -hmm that create angst yes. for our young adults. Yes. Oh, 
I heard my answer back there. He said, shoot him. <laughs> How do you prepare the on a shooting note? So <laughs> how do you prepare the body yeah. to be a welcoming presence? Yeah, and can I tell you that's a work. And what I'm saying is, you will always. I just believe that that as the leader, I have to model it, and I have to place myself at risk for the truth that I affirm and embody. But guess what? Because I I do a, I do a whole lot of teaching. I spend time just teaching and saying, what if? And then I make it real. For like this issue of homosexuality, I'll use case statements and I said, your son, your daughter. All right, now what? How do you? Mm -hmm. I remember in American Baptist Church, there was a national leader huh, who came out. But he, I mean, he, people invited him to preach, and he had a whole room full of what? Plaques and all kind of medals and everything. And then he resigned his position to go pastor an affirming, what they called an affirming and welcoming congregation. In his resignation letter, he wrote, I have traveled around the country with many of you. You've invited me to your congregations, and I have preached. I sit in my study looking at the letters of commendation, talking about how anointed I am and how my ministry has gifted so many. I see your recognitions. And he said, as I tell you this, I am gay. Am I still anointed? All these things you've been saying for 20 years, are they vitiated simply because I tell you I'm gay? Or can God still be the anointed presence in my life? Can't answer that, but guess what? Those are the type of things I'll bring to the church. And by, what, what would you say? Or what about, huh? Here you are, you're angry at this couple wanting to get married. Huh? And you got three children who are shacking up. That's what you know. How do we put this stuff together in our minds? How do we model God? I don't know, y'all. <laughs> I wish I could just simply say, here's the formula. And if you don't agree with me, you're all going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> or if you don't agree with me, we're going to split and divide and become the church of division rather than the chilled church modeling wholeness. And then the world is going to look and say, oh, this is what it means to be a Christian. Whenever you don't see eye to eye, you destroy each other. Or you move to where you can always be comfortable with the people who see eye to eye with you and not have to wrestle anymore with your faith. Those are the type of questions that I push. And they're not questions for you, they're questions for me. I still agonize. You made me think of something. You were talking a little while ago about the hierarchy in the church yeah. and how we make... We, because we've hierarchical, make God hierarchical. Yeah. And it made me think about my daughter's complaint that we say it's Youth's church or it's John's church. Mm -hmm. um, that, that there's a message in that when mm -hmm. we use that kind of ner terminology. And, it, and when she was asking the question, you know, the, the language that we use, it seems to me, sends messages. We need to be really careful about our language. Yes. And we can do that in terms of helping people in terms of the issue that is dividing our church right now yes. as well. What kind of language are we using? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. That, that is so good. Mm -hmm. That is so good. How do I speak? One of the things I always point, and we do it in the academy, and it's why I'm uncomfortable in the academy sometimes, we have to other each other. That means, you know, even if, so I'm saying this, if somebody else comes and says something different, I got to destroy you to legitimate me. I'm trying to prove, you know, who's the best thinker? Who's the holiness, holiest? Here's one thing I always say, and I'm going to stop on this because I need to stop. <laughs> 
it sounds absurd. The closer you get to God, the more of a sinner you become. See, whenever you claim self-righteousness and perfection, it's not indication of your maturation. It indicates you're still milk drinking milk. Because, see, when you first start this journey, you look into the light of God. But the light of God not only lets you see, it blinds you because you're looking into it. Come on, you huh? And you'll see the immediate things around you. And most of us end up with a legalistic list. Come on. You have that neophyte fever. I don't drink. I don't smoke around. Smoke run around. I don't smoke. I don't do this. Amen. Even to the point you find some folk who are new to the church will say things like this. I can't go to that Bible study. They're all heathens and hypocrites up there because I saw her in the store buying wine. <laughs> Come on. And you get this legalistic list. Now, but walk into God. And you aren't looking into the light. You're now positioned to look with the light. And your relationship with God will show you things that you never saw before. That you're not just responsible for that. Guess what? You've got to recognize your complicity of some evil that's going on on the other side of the world. Come on. And so whenever you get close to God, it's never how good I am. It's not my brother. It's not my sister. But it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. All right, let's take a break, y'all, okay? All right, God bless. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise. It is good to conference in this way and to be able to ask our questions. And Dr. Kenny, it's just so good to have you and to have you share with us in this way. Um, lunch is ready. And so as we leave out, we're going to say a prayer. And as we leave out and we go downstairs, uh, the ladies down there will direct you. We have uh, turkey, ham, roast beef. We have salads, so you have your choice uh, to pick from, but the ladies will guide you, and they're like bodyguards. You don't really want to mess with them. You want to <laughs> do with it. And so I know you're going to um, give us a word of prayer. Yeah, let's pause. Can you ask them to just sit at the table with each other, no particular design? Okay. But please take the opportunity, if you want to talk to somebody that engenders some questions that we want to deal with this afternoon. Okay. Mm. Let us pray. Amazing God, we are well met. We are well met by you. With each breath here that we have shared in the reflections of mind and spirit and in the life and laughter, even within our very own bodies, oh God, we have been fed already. But now, God, we shift venue and take something to our lips that sustains us in a different way. But it, too, is gift of you. We give you thanks for all of these blessings, for the blessing of this day. And we would ask that our interactions around table truly would be guided and stirred by you. Feed us, meet us. And may we meet each other, <laughs> for it is meet and right so to do. Guide us that gathered we may truly be the community of Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank so you. as you go out the doors, you can take the staircase. And Dr. Kenny never said anything about us, but he shared a story about when he first went out to preach. And he worked his sermon and he was ready to, to do this. And he said he was preaching and he was using words that he had put together. And we know his vocabulary is up there. And he said, one lady said to him, she said, Rev, I believe God has called you to the ministry. I believe God is using you. But when you serve me my food, I want to recognize it. And so when he shared that, he asked us the question, 
were we being relevant to our communities, the places in which we spoke? He never said, hey, I'm experiencing arrogance in the room. He never said that. He shared his own story, and he asked us whether we were being relevant in our context. So I just thank God for that kind of humility. And once again, Dr. Kenny, it's so good to have you. Let's give him another big hand. Thank you, uh, Pastor Derek, and uh, I trust all of you all had a wonderful lunch, and now you're all energized and uh, ready to just go to work. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> or you may have a deep case of the itis, you know, you're ready <laughs> uh, to go to sleep. So um, uh, what's that when I've heard people stand up and say, uh, Oh, uh, they'll say, um, uh, I am going to say to you what Elizabeth Taylor said to all of her husbands. I will not keep you long. <laughs> oh, all right. Praise God. Let me again just thank you for your gracious welcome and um, uh, for your receptivity to our discussion so far about this. And the reason that, first of all, I love theological discussion. I love to explore theology. Uh, I love to explore, uh, but the, what drives me is that your, 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 your thought patterns about God shape your behavior. And you know, so if you think God is up there, when you're godly, guess what you are? Mm-hmm. If you think God is the author of division, guess how you, you practice what you do? In a divisive, in a deficient, a divisive fashion. Um, uh, so we have to look at some of these things. And I think some of the things that we may be teaching that we've left unchallenged may be the reason why there may be a generation emerging that is not energized, you know, doesn't celebrate, it's not excited about the life of the church. Uh, one of my concerns is, is some of the people that I work with, where the young people are excited, they're excited by performance, not worship. In other words, they have these slamming choirs with the lively music, and folk come out, and they just get a, just so excited, and they just fill the place up, excited. But they are not being formed as disciples. You understand? They're not being formed where they can be even to articulate their faith. They'll say, man, that was one, man, we were, we were, we were popping this morning. Huh? But what about what, how is this, how is this anchoring you and um, giving you a life? So I, I, I wrestle with that. These are some times, seasons, um, that require us just, just to be faithful, sober and vigilant. Um, but somehow we have reduced sober and vigilance to maintaining the status quo. You're really a good, vigilant Christian if you don't change anything. Ah, see, that's a solid, that's a solid route. Amen. We had an interesting conversation at lunch, and I might as well just share a, a portion of it, that it came up, and I can't remember who asked it. I mean, uh, but they were talking about the fact how, why conservative churches are growing. There's some very conservative churches that are doing what? They're growing. But the reason they're growing is because they, I would want to suggest that they appeal to the same fear dynamics. And what they do is they promise you a privilege that is predicated upon the maintenance of the division. Everybody who's in your group is going to heaven, and all of them are going to. And we are, the, we are the real Christians. We are the real people of God. Come on over here and let's wage war on the rest of these folk who really aren't standing up for God. Now what it does, it immediately gives you um, a gang that's superior and dominant. And if you ever listen to the language, the language is a language of defeat. I'm gonna, we're going to defeat you. You're going to be a winner. It's the same thing when I talk about coming out of a deficiency model for theological education always talks about how bad we are. Um, all of us, it says all of us um, have fallen short of the glory of God. 
My concern is that the church is always telling you where you fell short. You cannot be charged with falling short unless you have a glory possibility. If glory is not a possibility, then I cannot hold you accountable for falling short. So therefore, to really for me to understand my short, you have to teach me more about my glory possibility. And once I know my glory possibility, you will not have to tell me where I fall short. My own knowledge will help me to see that's not worthy. Do you, uh, but if all you tell me, I'm not, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy, then guess what? I'm not worthy. But if you start telling me, you know what? This is your amazing design. This is what God did for you. That you have intrinsic worth and dignity is not predicated upon what you wear, what you look like, what you drive, where you, mm, that you are God's and God loves you. Now, given that you know that God loves you, what is the behavior of someone who's loved? Someone who, who greater things will do, they will do. Because I go to the creator. You, 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 you understand? Can I give you my mantra? See, having grandchildren and things that pluck my nerves at the same time I love them all just and spoil them. Amen. Come on. Yeah. Huh? Um, um, uh, they help me because sometimes they'll say something that will instruct me. And here's the thing that I teach all of them. You can never control the situations and locations nor somebody else's interpretation of your being. Therefore, you have to know this. Your situation and your location and somebody's interpretation is not the basis of your identification because your identification is in your creation, not your situation, location, or their interpretation. And once you claim a relation with the source of your creation, there's no situation, location, or interpretation that can place a limitation on your elevation and your destination. Come on. No, no, but do you understand what that? Now see, that's a, now guess what? That is theological anthropology to suggest that you never let where you are define who you are and you never allow somebody else's assessment of your being become internalized to the degree that you start defining yourself based upon what they say about you. Now that's how I might say in the classroom, but in the, in, when I'm talking to these young folk, your situation and your location and somebody else's interpretation is not the basis of your identification because your identification is in your creation, not your situation, your location, and their interpretation. And once you connect with the source of your creation, huh? there is no situation, location, or interpretation that can place a limitation. Huh? on your elevation and you don't define who I am and you don't tell me what I can be and do. Watch me. It does not yet appear. Huh. Come on. See? But let we, what we have done, the other, the phrase I used at the table at lunch was we identify people based upon the lie that's claiming them rather than the God that made them. So we, when we do that, we, we reinforce the lie. And then you're asking people to go out and be courageous after you just bombarded them with their nobody. Now we're going to go out here and we're going to make this world a better place. Oh, Lord, not me. Come on. What can I do? Hmm? Hmm? And so, 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 so we talk about things that are non-negotiable. The love of God and the fact that, you have in, in, that there's intrinsic worth and identity that is not derived from any context, but it's given to you by God. Now, just where we ended when we left, guess what? Can your, can your sexual practice rob you of the image of God? Do you have intrinsic worth and dignity even when you're violating that dignity? Does, can that violation rob you of the dignity? See, that's the question where you get in, in you understand? Now, then the problem is once you say yes, then you got to pick and choose who's out and who's in and which violations make you lose your dignity. So I, I might put a, does, does an, a racist have intrinsic worth and dignity. Yeah. Oh, you still got dignity, but you're letting a lie claim you, and you're distorting the dignity. Here's the way I try to teach it in a classroom. Let me show you something. Uh, uh, who, who got their iPads or iPhones? Google, 
Square watermelons. Square watermelons. Or try to look, look up, look up, see what come, we'll see what, huh? Yeah, there, come on, see, some of y'all been in my class and y'all know it well. But see, these are trying to illustrations instead of complexify something, try to show somebody what is going to happen to you. Because when you get, guess what, you go, a picture of square watermelons will come up. Right? Is the nature of the watermelon to be square? Somebody has to be acting on the watermelon to alter its manifestation so that it does not give expression to its intrinsic character. Come, look, see, look, 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 look. So you, your design is to be oval or round. Stuff can come and mess with your design, but it can't alterate what's intrinsic to you. There it is. You're on the job, man. I need you in my church so you can pull things up. Now, guess what? You just heard it. I need you at my church. I need you at the Lord's church where I'm privileged to pastor. Amen. <laughs> no, no, you see that? So it's not the nature of the watermelon to be what? Square. But what do they do? They put it in plexiglass containers to square it. Why do they do that? Because it makes what is in the watermelon more usable. Oh, no, no, no. I am shaping you so that you can be objectified to serve my purposes. I will violate your intrinsic nature so that I shape you to fit me, my need, and for you not to be who I meant you to be. You understand? And so guess what the world is doing to us? Come on. Squaring and distorting our theology and everything so we fit the box. You fit the box. Now, anybody who comes out of the box is considered unfit. Y'all see it? So the deviant person is the person who does not fit what we've designed. So therefore, when you begin to glorify God fully, guess what happens to you? You get crucified. Because deviance is defined by the lie and not by the truth. Now, the other thing is, if you ever, guess what happens? If you ever get out of that box, you immediately start growing back round. And one of the things is, because I've seen it, when, the, when you take them out of the box and they've been squared and they start trying to grow under round, for a period they look very ugly and misformed. Why? The moment where you appear like there's something wrong with you may be the moment where you're journeying to your fullness. The journey to fullness is always, is never without lumps. No, come on. Come on. See, because when you get out of that box, there's some places, come on, there's some places where you, when you start coming out, and guess what, guess what somebody's going to do? Another way to illustrate this is when you, when you came out the grave, he took the grave clothes off. You see, you can come out the grave and still be covered with the vestiges of graveyard existence to the, to, the, to the degree that even when you come out the grave, you're still shaped by your death place. You're still wrapped. Come on. And your mobility and your behavior is now being shaped not by the fact you're out the grave, but by your grave clothes. Oh, come on, see? So guess what? So even out the grave, how do you move? When you come out the grave, it says your face was covered. You still see death, speak death, smell death. Can I show you some people who got grave clothes on, what they look like when they come to church and breathe? Because <laughs> they're breathing through the stench of a graveyard. <sighs> Loose him and let him go. She's got to understand. See, that's the process of coming back to life. It's not just coming out the grave. And here's what we do. Here's what, you, know, you know what we do? We think we've done a great job because they've come out the grave. And we leave them bound. And the tragedy is the reason we can't unbind them, because we're still bound ourselves. So when you come to church and you don't fit in with the binding, when you start losing some of those grave clothes, guess what, guess what I do? Child, you, know, you don't have on your church clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tie you back 
let me wrap you back up. Because we want you out of the grave, but don't you get rid of that death stuff. Bring that death tough stuff to church now. We still wear death when we get here. Notice, can I show you all something? That the assignment to the church is never to raise the dead. That's what Jesus did. The mission of the church was to roll the stone away and loose them. Oh, y'all, come on, come on, come on, come on. See, it said, it said, he told them, roll the stone away. Amen. In other words, what I want you to do is remove the structural impediments that hinder the capacity of those who have been assigned to the death zone to receive what I'm trying to offer. You need to be a holy roller. <laughs> no, no, come on, work with me. See, when he came to him, he said, now y'all tell him to raise the dead. You know, and I've come to accept this. I don't raise dead folk. Jesus does. And if I speak life, I speak it in the name of Jesus. Hmm? Amen. Do you, come on. Do, do, do you see? In the name, I can't raise you. I've never saved anybody. Huh? But I can address those structures that are hindering the receptivity of the good news. Because, see, you read the text, and it tells you what it is. The structure is there to keep the stinky people in their place. Y'all didn't hear me. See, I, I have defined him as dead, right? He's been four days, so therefore decomposition is set in. He's what? He's stinky. We got to make sure the stinky folk don't huh, pollute our sweet-smelling neighborhood. We got to keep them, those people in their place. So you not only define people a certain way, you construct realities that make sure they stay where they are based upon how I've defined them. On this side are the... Those are the stinky, right? On this side, now these are the good people. We're sweet, sweet smelling. And what can happen is you so internalize the definition of the world of your own brothers and sisters that you start calling them stinky rather than brothers and sisters. Oh, come on. And you start saying, make sure you don't roll those stone away because you'll let some of those polluted folk get in here. Come on. Look at it. And see, Jesus is say rolling the stone away. What are we saying? They stink. Don't let that stinky, those stinky groups affect us because we're the sweet smelling group people. Guess what you just said? Jesus, forget about them. We, we're the ones you ought to be concerned about. Let them stay over there. And guess what Jesus says? I want you to remove the structures of separation and division that have dehumanized them and make them own their only possibility in their existence is continued death. Hold, be a holy roller. Roll a stone away. That's what I'm asking the church to do. Now notice if you read that text clearly, and that's 11th chapter of John, it says, read at the end of it, and it says, and some of them went back and told the Pharisees what they were doing. Guess what? There will always be those in the midst who instead of celebrating that stones are being rolled away, will run back to the bishop and say, do you know what they're doing over there? <laughs> they're rolling stones away. They're going to let some stinky folk out. Ooh. Then after the stone is rolled away, he doesn't say, now y'all go raise him. Jesus steps in. Lazarus! Come on, guess what? Yo, I'm going to show you something. One of the key things in resurrection is that you've got to help people obtain their proper identification. See, you cannot expect actualization that is rooted in false identification. You cannot call them into a being if they don't know who they are. Everybody else is called just stinky, even your own brothers and sisters. I call you by name. I know who you are. Come on. See? So if you look at how Jesus raises, this is another whole lecture thing. We just, just did this in Alabama, is that if you look at the resurrection model of Jesus, there are three things that you must do to raise the dead. There's more than three, but here's how he does it. You take the widow's name. Young man, get up, I tell you. Come on. What you do is you make an affirmation that calls forth an actualization based on an authorization. Young man, that's, a, that's what? That's an affirmation. That's your identification. 
Now that you know who you are, I expect you to act a certain way. Get up. You shouldn't be wallowing in death and defeat. Young man, get up. And who tells you? I tell you. In the name of Jesus. In the name. I have affirmed your being, called you to an actualization, and here's my authorization. Not in the name of Republicans or Democrats. Not in the name, come on, of psychology, where I may go, you understand what I'm saying? In the name of Jesus. Get up! Amen. Can I just get parenthetically, I know nothing. Guess what he did? He said, get up. What did the young man do? Sat up. Now, some people read that and get mad. He didn't get up. No, you got to realize that sometimes getting up is a process. And the problem we have in the church sometimes, we beat up people for sitting up when we, they were told to stand up because they don't move as fast as we would like them to do. But sometimes the journey to resurrection is a process. And you got to know how to handle people who are sitting up and not condemn them, but encourage them in standing up. You got anybody in, you, anybody in here, a nurse or a nurse? Or, anybody? I had, when I had hip surgery, the first time I had hip surgery, I, I, you know, I knew I could do anything, shoot. You know, I had, I had, even though I was in pain, I did three miles on a treadmill before I, next day I went in the hospital. The day I set up, I, when they said, okay, we want you to g get up, I thought I could jump right up. I jumped up and took one step, and they had to grab me and keep me from falling down. And the nurse apologized. Guess what she said? Oh, I'm so sorry. I should have made you dangle before you stood up. See, when you've been laid out, you don't stand straight up. You need to sit up before you stand up. Here's the mistake we make in the church. We tell them to get up and then beat them up when they sit up when that's a time to invest in them and help them rise up. And we don't know how to handle dangling people when dangling is a stage of your resurrection. I just knew, I, I thought you was going to jump right up. Nope. It's interesting, and I don't want to get off on this, but it's interesting, but we were dealing with this death concept. You ever notice when a woman got up? She stood up and started walking. How come the woman stands up and the man sits up? Come on, do you have a race? And how I interpret that, you know, when I'm doing my thing, is that it shows you the specificity of the character of resurrection that always implies or we can infer some aspect of your death. The man sat up and spoke. What's the biggest problem with men? We don't talk. Come on, y'all. We are very non-communicative men. Take us out of the pulpit and we don't say a word to anybody. Come on. Amen. Come on. She's trying to talk to me and I'm all I'm doing. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. And there are, there are studies shown that men only use one-third to one-half of the symbols in a day that a woman uses. No, seriously, there you can study, you can, you can Google that and study about that women, me, women use a lot more symbols than men. No, you want to make it plain? Can I make it real plain to you? If I say, if I come, if I go to come home, if I call my wife and say, hey, don't cook, I'm going to take you out. She said, oh, okay. I come home and I, she said, where are we going? Oh, well, I really want to go to Bookbinders. She said, oh, well, I got to change my clothes. I was going to wear this. I didn't know. The next day, my son come by the house and say, hey, y'all went out last night? I say, yeah, we went to Bookbinders, man. It was good. I like that. There's a seafood thing. I like that. Ask her. Yeah, we went out. John called me about 2.35, and when he called me, he said we was going out. I thought we were going to go out and go to, go just go to Applebee's or somewhere. When he came home and told me we was going to Bookbinders, I had to go in and change my clothes. I, you, know, you know that red dress I had with the blue and the blue top? I got, come, come on, huh? And then I couldn't find my earring, so I went next door and got married. You know, she got those blue things there. And, I, you know, when we went down, I thought he would drive down the interstate, but he drove down number one. And I thought then he got back on it. And then when we went there, we went there, and we got there. And when we got there, they, were, they said they were crowded, but I saw John slip him a little something, and we sat in a, <laughs> we sat in the third table on the right side of the room by the window with the flower in the window. Come on, and I had I was going to get this, but then I got that salad. I thought I didn't think I needed a salad, and then I wanted some bread, but I shouldn't because you know it's too much carbohydrate, and I'm trying to do, huh? Huh? Yeah. 
And see, what some of y'all sisters, can I clue you in? What y'all don't understand? After I've gone to work and I've come home, I've used all but one of the words I got left. <laughs> so when I come in and you want to talk, I say, hey. <laughs> All right, you can say amen. You ain't got to be <laughs> No, no, no. But what I'm saying is, guess what? We don't tend to talk. So look, on our way to resurrection, what happens to men? We start talking. We start communicating. Even to the degree that in many places, women are the praisers and we are the observers. Come on. See, it's okay for you women to get what? Animated and filled, but, well, it doesn't take all of that. As a man of God, we should keep things decently in order. So, you know, so guess what? It's, you, it's the woman's job to praise God because I don't, that's not, but once God gets in your life, I have to speak. Huh? And I have to praise. You see, because you see, it's the distinctiveness of how death has affected you because part of the death is you've been shaped by this reality and you're believing a, a pattern of living that's a function of your dying. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. God, I can praise you. Huh? My sister, I can talk to you. Yes, guess what? I do have feelings too. And I can communicate those feelings. And they don't make me less than a man because I have emotion. I'm tired of trying to be a man so much that I'm not allowed to be human. And he, 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 he says, he say, you roll a stone away, come on. Huh? And then after, they, after he calls them forth, guess what he says? I'm giving... Notice in every one of the resurrection stories, he give the resurrection person back. Come on, Jairus' daughter gave him back to his mother and father and said what? Feed her. Don't let me raise them and then they come to you and starve to death. Partner with me in ministry. Feed those I bring life to. Come on. huh? Come on, look at this. In... in, in um, the raising of the widow of Nain, he says, and he gave him back to his mother. I take you back, and can you all take care of them after the raising? In John, in, in the raising of Lazarus, what? Loose them. Loose them. Because what the Bible just told us, people are not resurrected without bearing the vestiges of a graveyard existence. And the ministry of the church is we got to lose some people. Amen. How can we lose if we're still dressed in our grave clothes? That's just a challenge. It. Hmm? Amen. So this dehumanization, this death that I divide from you, and the death is what? Once I divide, then, then we, we, the distortion becomes what? The hierarchy. Because, see, I believe that we're relational and bent creatures. We get separated. But in fallenness, when we come back together, we don't come like this. We come like this is the distortion. And this is the, the, the distortion that we, what in the scripture would be called, you're walking in darkness. You've left the light. You're walking in darkness. And what happens in the distortion, you institutionalize brokenness and hark. Uh, a hierarchy as normative for God's design. So in the church, we teach what? Men over women. Come on. We set up opposing realities, one having value and one not. Guess what? Baptist over Methodist. Come on, y'all. Or Methodist over Baptist. Or Pentecostals over... Come on. Or Catholics over Protestant. Nope, y'all got a pope. We are God's people. So now it's Protestants over Catholics. And don't say a word about Christians over Muslims. Come on. Because everyone, I don't know how to relate to you without relating to you from a superior and an inferior. We can't all be servants of God. I have to be higher than you. 
And we, can I say this? It's tragic. The way we evangelize people, we evangelize to be, join a superior religion. Think about it for a moment. I'm not evangelizing you to connect with all creation. I'm evangelizing you so you can be better than the rest of the vote. Just think about that. Is the purposes of Christ to form a better religion or to restore authentic relationship? And see, Jesus, I said this before, Jesus did not come to create another hierarchy. He didn't say, okay, here were the Jews, and the way it's presented in the Bible, let's flip it now. Christians here, these folk are here. And if you would ever become Christian, then you would be straight. No, nope. work with me. Don't, 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 don't misunderstand. But, but twist this, but understand the system you've, we've started. We are using Jesus to support, condone, and institute a new hierarchy rather than the presence of God that collapses the hierarchy. Because see, look, and the first shall be last and last first, the way we interpret it. That's right. And we teach this all the time. Just listen. I listen all the time. Guess what? That's right. If you just get with Jesus, you're going to be the head, not the tail. Come on. If you get with Jesus, come on. And that's not what he's talking about. The first, the last shall be first. And the first shall be last. When we come to the knowledge, there's no need for a first and a last. Because the two have become one. Hmm. I don't live to be first. I live to be the best me that I can be. And I recognize to be the best me that I can be. I need to be in relationship. I have come, listen to this, I have come to heal, not to destroy. But look for word, the word heal. Do a word study on it. You know what it talks about? Sewing together a torn fabric. The places you've been torn apart. And by my stripes you are healed. If all he does is get rid of your cold and you're bragging about how he healed your body, you can still be very healed in body, but be very sick in being. So guess what? It's not. It's. And this is literally what happened. So the distortion and the darkness occurs is when we start glorifying death and we assign value to people in a system that devalues people. And we make it what? The standard. It's the norm. You know what? When I really begin to understand the gift of God, you became so beautiful. Story told of a man who was looking out his window, and he always called his wife, look, honey, look at that dingy, dirty stuff. You know, y'all remember when you used to hang clothes on the clothesline? Mm. He'd look out the window, look how nasty that dirty clothes are. Look how nasty they are. They got some of the dirtiest clothes. Why would you even say that, huh? And then guess what he did? He washed the window he was looking out of. <laughs> The dirt was not in the clothes, but the lens you were using to view the clothes. Yeah. And all of a sudden, dirty clothes became clean because you washed your window. How can you see the moat in your brother's eye and you can't yeah. see the beam in your own? Why? If you got a beam, whatever you look through becomes what? The hermeneutic and the lens through which you view reality. Can it make it plain? See, if you look through blue, what do you see? Look through rose? What? So what's in my eye defines what I see. And if you, all, if you can see the moat in your brother's eye, it must mean the lens of your interpretation is the mess in your eye. If every time you look at somebody, you always see bad. Mm -hmm. Honey, you know, mm -mm, Lord have mercy. Mm -hmm. Amen. So you see, may I may I enter your space? Yes. Yeah, come here. Yeah. So, <laughs> You're my dean. 
Okay, okay. So you see me. Ooh, we. I saw, you know that preacher that came down there for the academy? Huh? I, you know, at first I thought he was a holy man. <laughs> then I saw him hugged up with Linda. Lord have mercy. And she laid his head all on her chest. <laughs> I, you know, I, I ain't going to tell nobody but you, but something going on. I know. I, <laughs> come on, come on. And then we'll say something like this. I wouldn't tell you, but I synced it with my own eyes. <laughs> now, but look, you didn't tell me what you saw. I was just expressing appreciation for a long time, friend. But the way you interpreted it, you didn't say a thing about me and her. You told me what you would be doing if you were in our situation. Oh, oh. You made a statement about what's in you, not what's in us, because that's the lens through which you see life. Hmm. Mm. So, uh, say, we say all of this is that we have literally reached the point where the distortion is normative. We vote death. Come on. We don't even think about it. We don't, because it's what? And that's why I always challenge people. I'm, I'm not going to talk about race. I'm a, um, I'm a man, right? There is no man formed in these United States of America without sexist overtones. Amen. Amen. You, we, we are, come on. I grew up, and even some of my kindness to women grew out of the negation of women. You poor little helpless. Them. <laughs> no, come on. You all under, you understand what I'm saying? And guess what? I have grown tremendously. But guess what? I am not free from the residual elements of my formation. I'm a recovering sexist. What did you say? Who said it? I'm sorry, I said so are women. Absolutely. Just like racism, guess what? Shapes black folk. We're messed up by racism. Amen. We've internalized so much of this that it's woven into the fabric of our country. And one of my biggest problems with nice when I say this, nice non-black people is, they think they've arrived. And if you ever think you have arrived, you're a racist. If you ever say things like, I don't have a racist bone in my body, <laughs> that just shows me how racist you are. Because guess what? I can't say to my sisters, as much as I've grown and as much as I do teaching that I do, guess what? I'm still expanding where those subtle things still are part of my formation. Come on. And so every now and then I have to say what? Forgive me. Or when I'm sitting with sisters and they begin to speak their pain and their pain becomes my pain, I have to say to them, forgive me for the ways that I have participated in inflicting pain on you. I'm still a work in progress. I don't apologize for that because that's what the Holy Ghost does. See, a lot of folk like the Holy Ghost so they can shout and get happy. The Holy Ghost will convict you. <laughs> it will call you to another level of saying, wait a minute, this is not what it means to walk with God. All right? So as we see this distortion, you understand how it's institutional? It's institutionalized. And religion becomes a primary medium for the operation of death because we're constantly creating divisions and saying which is superior, which is inferior, who has value and who doesn't have value. And can I show you this? And this is y'all y'all just listen to me. Okay? I, this is what I'm still wrestling with. The trick of the demon was to have you believe that you have no value until you get what I'm giving you. Isn't that what he said? You'll, have, you'll be somebody when you get that. Is the way that we teach about our faith actually demonic? 
Because we tell people you won't have value until you get what I got. Are we still doing what the snake does and not people help, help people discover their value, but assigning them value after we take authority? And I didn't say Jesus. I said we. Just a thought, y'all. Okay, y'all praying for me? Okay, all right, please. Thank you. Who said that quickly said yes? Amen. Thank you. I appreciate that. Amen. Uh, uh, my students will tell you my very first day of class, you all, I say, look, you all, I really love the Lord. And I have been saved by Jesus Christ. But if any of y'all feel a need to pray for my salvation, please do. <laughs> all right. Now, look, look. All right. Put the next one up there. Deliverance. Hallelujah. Uh, uh, look at this. The distortion is we live by the distortion and you enter into darkness. Thank God, guess what? There is deliverance and what? Delight. Y'all know where this comes from? My grandchildren again. Um, they spend time with me in the summer and my wife in the summer. Um, um, uh, and when they were young, I made sure there was a nightlight in the room. Huh? Now that they're like 11, 12 years old, I took the, the, the nightlight out. This summer, this summer, huh? He's 12 years old or with me, and all of a sudden I hear them screaming, Papa! I jump up, what's wrong? What's wrong? Uh, we need a nightlight. I said, but you are too grown. You don't need a light in here. And here's what my grandson said, Papa. Everybody <laughs> needs delight in the darkness. <laughs> and he didn't say the light, he said delight in the darkness. <laughs> there you go. And understand that, that God brings delight. Because God is light and in God there is no darkness at all and God offers delight to the darkness. No, come on, come on. Think about that. See, see, see. And guess what I've defined? Guess what I've discovered? I'm grown. But in the, dark, the darkness, I need some delight. I need the delight. I need the light that shines in the darkness. And so, guess who Jesus is? Jesus is the light in the darkness. Jesus is deliverance in the distortion. In the distortion that you have embraced. The distortion that has created the toxicity that we're all polluted with. And here's the danger. I, mean, I showed you the, the, the square watermelon. Can I tell you, there was one other thing about the square watermelon I didn't tell you. Whenever you take a seed out of a square watermelon and let it grow, it grows round. They can square you, but they can't take the seed out of you. Because in your seed is the design of God. And the square is trying to make you think you're other than that. And I'm so glad that when we get set free, we can bear seeds and create, grow the fruit. Come on. Amen. Now, now look at this. Look at this. This, this, this delight, this delight of God, that God brings delight. Because here's when I talk about the deliverance. We said there were two lies that were told, right? About God and about you. Jesus is truly God and truly human, correcting the lie about God and the lie about you. The good news of Jesus is not just about God, it's about you. Come on. Emmanuel. God is with you. Hallelujah. The God who was, was, you have believed was over you is where? Hmm? And guess what? You are the human, come on, who represents the seed of God. Uh-oh, what? Here's where I get in trouble when you have to pray for my salvation. That in a very real sense, the birth story of Jesus is also about your birth. When you came into being, you were not just the seed of man. You were the seed of God. And guess what? Each of you is virgin, a product of virgin birth. Well, what's the virgin about? I ain't virgin. No, no, no. Wait a minute. No, no, you miss it. Virgin simply means that you represent that which is fresh and has never been known before. 
No two human beings have the exact same fingerprints, DNA markers. markers. No two human beings have the exact same retina rod configuration in the eye. With the new form, they're going to have what? Voice recognition that no two human beings have the exact same. You cannot imitate. Guess what? That means that you are a distinct instance of divine dexterity. There never was one like you before and never will be another one like you. You're a virgin. You're a virgin existence. You're fresh. You're new never been here. You are a product of God's activity. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're not the product of a fallen seed. You're the product of God's seed. Oh, come on. Do you see it? God is just, Jesus has just redef redefined what it means to be human. And he's also redefined what it is to know God. God presents God's self in creation. Fallenness misrepresents God. Jesus represents God and represents God. You understand? You went from presentation to misrepresentation to representation. You understand? That's the delight. I now know me and I now know God. You can't know God without discovering the truth about yourself. Amen. Amen. And what we're using God is, we're using God to preserve the lie about you rather than be discovering and celebrating. Huh? Come on. Huh? Anyone who will lose himself will what? Find himself. We only teach you how to lose. We don't teach you about what you find. And the, 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 the you you lose is the you that wasn't you in the first place. It wasn't you. It was you living against you. It was a sin warring against your nature, not the expression of your nature. You were living outside of yourself. Did you hear what I'm saying? You are not honoring yourself. You were non-actualized. You were inauthentic. Guess what? And so I don't name you by the lie that claims you, but by the God that made you. And I know this is hard. It's hard. It's hard to come out. Of it. And you get in this bump stage where you're coming out of it. But what I'm saying is how do we begin to teach it? And I say not the teaching. See, my problem with some of the teaching is, oh, you're wonderful. You're blessed. You got to realize God loves you and you're so wonderful. But guess what? that does it makes you feel good where you are rather than invite you to be a prophetic instance that transforms where you are see what they teach you is what what it teaches is God loves you and he wants you prosperous and he wants you God loves you so much he wants to recognize you to recognize and challenge that which does not witness to that truth Uh, my concern is that the lifting up of a, of a high anthropology is engendering passive people who are trying to get more and want to be blessed in what is. When you truly understand the, the integrity and identity of who you are in God, it causes you to challenge any form of existence that does not the honor the integrity of all creation. It doesn't let me be passive. It empowers me to say, no, this is not God because I've come to the truth, the true knowledge of God, and I've discovered my true self. All right? You see that? Deliverance, delight. Hallelujah. I, amen. Amen. Um, um, this Sunday, I'll be preaching a sermon. It's our choir day, and I'm preaching a sermon, join the choir. But who I'm asking you to join, I'm going to show them a text where it says, and God delights in you and sings over you. God sings to glorify you. And you ought to join his choir and glorify God. God literally sings over you. That's what it says. Prophet Zephaniah. He says, and God will delight in you and sing over you. After you've been through all of this trouble, guess what? God's got plans for you. And when you come to this truth, God is already practicing. He's singing over you. Huh? Do you all know the universe sings? Have you all related this, the latest science where they've used this, these uh, acoustical telescopes? And guess what they've discovered? That when you put these acoustical telescopes way out in space, you hear music. The universe is humming. And they even identify, I'm not a musician, they've identified what tone it is. 
and how you, where it is on the musical scale. And when you can get way out in space, you don't hear silence and ignorance. You hear, <laughs> the universe is humming. I got that in my notes there. I'm gonna, you know, and I want to talk about if you say, wait a minute, I hear music in the air. Mm. Now science is saying, Wait a minute, I hear music in the air. Let us see if we can explain it. But on Sunday, I'm going to say, there must be a God. And it's just confirmed in this scripture that says God is singing over you. Ah, <laughs> oh, I got a singing God. No, no, let, let, don't, don't think about it for a moment. God is up there delighting in you. That's my child. And when you exercise your identity and your gift according to glorify God, guess what God says? Let me strike up the music. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. And the universe is singing. So in the very real sense, this delight, this delight, God is the light. Jesus is the light of the world. But he's the light of the world because he exposes you to the darkness. And don't use the light to elevate the darkness. Or use the light to dispel the darkness. Hmm. What bioethicists say that in a polluted environment, in order to survive, life forms adapt downward. Did you hear that? In a polluted environment, in order to survive, life forms adapt downward. When the environment of the life form is polluted, in order to keep living, you got to join the pollution in survival. If the environment is polluted, you got to do what? Adapt downward. And then the standard of wellness becomes the pollution, not the righteous. Can I make this plain? Um, um, well, the blood pressure, blood pressure should be 120 over 80. Now they're saying or lower, right? So if you've got a family with hypertension, huh? And so for this family, the blood pressure is 150 over 98, but yours is 140 over 92. And then you say what? They're sick. Because now wellness is not established by deviation from the standard, but by deviation from the pollution. You see it? And now we're calling ourselves well because we're not as polluted as somebody else. Rather than saying this is God calling us to a standard. Hallelujah. And my deviation is based upon that standard, not the pollution. See? Come on. I can't look at you and say, oh, I only got three girlfriends. You got five. So I'm holy. <laughs> No, do you, you understand what I'm saying? So, so the delight of God, the delight, the, here's the delight. The joy actually raises a standard. It doesn't reduce it. It raises and say, oh, God, I want to live in to the fullness of this. Uh, 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 this week I spent time, y'all going to think I'm crazy, working on my Advent series. No, you say, what? Huh? No, no. What? Uh -huh. Because I just want a theme. I wanted, we had our quarterly meeting, and I wanted to give them the Christmas theme already because they do plays and stuff, and I, the Christmas theme is black joy. Yeah, black joy. <laughs> uh, Christmas joy. <laughs> Which in many respects is coterminous with black joy. No, <laughs> but what I'm talking about is all the sermons I'll be preaching will look at the joy in Zachariah and Elizabeth joy, Mary's joy. I'm going to do a sermon on Joseph joy. When you found out that the lady you thought had stepped out on you, only moved into God. There's joy for men. Mm -hmm. Come on, I kind of, kind of, you know, I, when I, whenever I start thinking, I start sketching and I work. Amen. And then you know what? The shepherd's joy. Uh-huh. When you're watching your sheep at night, when you settle in nighttime activity and work in darkness, and then all of a sudden, the light shines and you get delight, joy to the world. Come on. 
I seen the light, the marvelous light. <laughs> okay, now, now, uh, but in any, in any event, Jesus, how do we begin to talk about Jesus as what? The deliverance and the delight from what? The system of distortion. All right, put the next one up there. Amen. So we're going to get ready to bring this thing to a close. What's the next word up there? Devolution. What does devolution mean? Uh, very good. See? Profound. The opposite of evolution. Somebody Google devolution or devolution. Google it. Somebody, come on, y'all. This is what I do on Sunday now. I give, I give, I say, come on, look it up. Now have somebody stand up and say, this is what the word means. Now do you understand what I just said? <laughs> come on. Somebody. Anybody find it? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh. Okay, that's all right. That, that, that's okay. There was a there was a there was a misspelling in uh in one of the songs too. Yeah. What does it say? Uh huh. What else? Wow. Oh, y'all see now, isn't it amazing that her definition puts it in terms of governmental structures, where it's a transfer of power from the folk who got it to somebody who's considered lower. Oh, and that wasn't even the one I was looking for. No, no, because you go back, what? Some things do what? Evolve. Sometimes you got to do what? Devolve. Come out from under the powers that have been defining you. And guess what? What if we begin to understand discipleship as devolution? It is helping people come out from under the system that the world has developed, and I'm discipling you into a new model of living and being. Think about it. See, we are discipling people to assent to propositions about God. What if we help them devolve from a way of being where they become true students of God? And so therefore, when I, the one of the words I'm using is devolution as tantamount to discipleship. You see, I don't have to just have to teach you some, something. I have to teach you what has been controlling you and even controlling how you think about God, which may be contrary to the very nature of God. We're going to disciple you by taking you into a process of devolution so that you can become a disciple of that which is evolving now in God. Amen. You all ever heard hear the word the insurrection of subjugated knowledge? I mentioned that earlier. Literally, where people who are not being heard are now being heard. You listen to this. See? And so now this devolving says, wait a minute, wait a minute. And you've got to understand there's a generation that's devolving. And you're fighting it as a step away from discipleship when it may be the new model of discipleship. I got to grow you out of certain patterns of the way that we have embraced and honored uh, the distortion. You got that? Amen. All right. Okay. Uh, uh, and this is something I'm working on right now. What do I do that? How do I disciple and even in my preaching? So I, so I help people see some things very, very differently. Amen. On yesterday, um, we, um, the, the church where I pastor, we never have church meetings that stand alone. Every church meeting is a part of a worship service. So we have our church meetings on Sunday. Go through our worship service and don't, don't dismiss the church service until we've had, what? Our business meeting. Because a business meeting ought to be an act of worship. And there should be nothing in a business meeting that's not a function of your acts of worshiping God. So don't let your spirit change because it's business. You're still in worship. Well, when, when I do that on those days, 
one of the things, we literally changed the starting time of our service and we used the Sunday school educational hour for worship so that we can have a long worship that includes business. But on those days that we do that, the sermon text will always be what? The church school lesson. Huh? So yesterday the sermon title was what? The Lord provides. Uh-huh. And it was about what? Elijah and, and the widow of Zarephath, and I, come on, the Lord provides. The first point in the sermon, though, is that God, first thing that God provides is not stuff, but a purpose. God calls you to something. One of the greatest gifts that God has given you is a calling on your life. And it's not just about being a preacher, but you have a purpose. He was called to be a prophet. And in this season, maybe he's calling all of us to be prophets who will dare to go before the Ahabs of this world and tell them if you keep living the way you're living, destruction is going to come. The stock market may be going up, but your world is falling down. Huh? Will you stand for profit or principle? You understand? So, you know, so, and I can tell you, you know, the, next word, the next word was what? Provision. God never calls you without giving you what you need to function effectively in your call. He provides for you. Guess what they mean? And I said, that's good news because if you're faithful for your calling, sometimes it'll make it appear that you're going to be without. Come on. But God will give you brooks and ravens. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When you dare to honor what God has provided for you in the form of a call, God will provide for you what you need to remain faithful and alive in that call. Do you understand? God said, now, I know the drought is coming, but I'm going to give you water when there should be no water and food when there be no food. In other words, I'm going to give you what you need so you can continue the work that I've called you to do. Anybody ever been there? Well, you can testify right now you didn't have it and you shouldn't have had it, but God provided because you were being faithful for a call. Now, here's the thing. I'll provide water from a brook, and you can analyze the significance of a brook, but then also what fed him? Ravens. Ravens are scavenger birds. They usually come and steal what you got. Oh, God. God will so fix it that the folk who've been taken from you will have to give to you. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. God will provide. But in our, part of his other his provision is what? Power. Remember the boy died? He will give power to you to bring life where the powers of death are trying to stake a claim. He'll not only keep you alive, he'll give you power to bring other folk alive. The Lord provides. Huh? Come on, you stop looking at it. Here's an amazing thing. Y'all know this is what I enjoy. Because I'm not a good preacher, but I love to give stuff to preachers that preachers can preach. Look at this. He lacked, she lacked. But both of them affirm God. And when you add a faith lack to a faith lack, you get more. No, you didn't hear me. <laughs> she lacked, he lacked. You added lack and lack together. When you should have got double lock, lack, you got double blessing. Oh, that's some spiritual mathematics. I don't have, you don't have, but I want you to give what you don't have to my don't have, and then after it, both of us going to have more than any of us had when we didn't have. Come on. And you know, you know what the final point was, the transition to celebration? It says, and she praised him. And I had to tell the church, guess what? I don't want y'all to praise me. I'm not going to praise the president. Amen. And you need to recognize that anybody who will cut you off because you don't praise them does not want to honor God, but wants to honor themselves. Don't praise me. But if God has made provision, somebody ought to say thank you. Somebody ought to praise God and be able to testify the moments when you lack and somebody else who lacks sowed into your life and because both of you were faithful in your giving in your lack that you ended up with more than you ever had when you lacked. Come on, come on, because the crews never, come on, never ran out of, come on. Y'all, come on, why, why? You get, see, we missed that, we missed that. Can I show you something else? Because here's what preachers are doing. Preachers are coming up to you and say, look, God will bless you, but what you need to do is to sow into my hand. Mm 
<laughs> See, what people are doing is coming up and taking what you got so they will have and then promising them that they will have. But notice what he said. Make a cake for me and for you and your son. In other words, when you give to me, I don't want you to go without. And if you do this, and we're both faithful to God because God has commanded this, guess what? We're going to have more. But none of us will be without. I'm not asking any of you to give to be without. I'm asking us to share our lack to the point that we can step into a blessing. Hmm. And be careful of folk who want, to, want you to give to them so that you have nothing. Amen. That's not, that's not the model, God's model of stewardship right there. Amen. Because, see, the blessing was already occurring. She said, I only have enough for me and my son to eat a last meal. He said, no, you got enough for a third person. Fix mine, too. And you will never want Mm -hmm. Somebody mess with that. Somebody get with that and say, ooh, what is this? All right. Come on, let's bring this to a close. Uh, do you see this? Discipleship is actually coming out from under. And what's the last one? Ta-da. <laughs> okay. Destiny. There it is. Destiny and design. You notice how we started with what? Design and destiny. In the design is your destiny. Now we have a destiny that violates the design. And it's not utopic, it's dystopic. Oh, now, work with me. In the beginning there was a design. Buried in the design was God's destiny for all creation, God's desire. But now we have a destiny that has a design that's not a function of God's design, but of what the devil did. Look, look, look. When God designed it, where were we? In the fulfillment of God's kingdom based upon what we teach in the church, where will we be? Heaven and hell. Oh, y'all, come on. So we are affirming a future not created by God and restored by Jesus, but one that fulfills the behavior of the demonic where eternality is separated, divided, and hierarchicalized with an above and below. Can y'all work with me? Do we need to start thinking about how we speak of a heaven that's not predicated upon separation and hierarchy, but unity, wholeness, and restoration? Let me, let me just say this for me. If Christ did not heal us and overcome ultimate separation, then the future is def defined by the demonic and not by the delight. Think about it. God created it one way. Powers disrupted it. Jesus came to heal us, but in the end, it will be disrupted. Ah, oh, I'm getting that look that I got in that church that I was in. And isn't it amazing that we will celebrate anything and everything that may be different until you start talking about the end where you feel comfortable with somebody going to hell. Because it, you, in the end, you're privileged and somebody else is excluded. You used to exclude them because of race, because of gender, because of sexuality, but in the end, you get to exclude them because of religion. Hmm. Y'all praying with me? Now, here's the real question. Does the love of God transcend the distortion, or is the distortion eternalized in glory, even to the point that God's fulfilled reign will be characterized by separation, division, and hierarchy. And see, right away, people say, oh, you're talking about universal salvation. 
Oh, no, we don't affirm universal salvation. No, 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 no. And the, and the big word for that is apocatastasis that you affirm. Even Karl Barth was accused of apocatastasis. But you know why he was accused of it? He said, anytime you put anybody in hell, you just placed a limitation on God's grace and made yourself God. Your job is never to put anybody in hell, but to make witness to the love of God manifest in Jesus Christ that can get everybody in. But he also said it's not your job to put everybody in heaven, because if you do that, you are playing God too. That's not your job. Your job is to witness to the power of God to heal everybody. But you can't dictate who's where. Ah, uh, come on, come on, come on. I understand what he's saying. Can I say this? It's going to sound strange. I believe that nobody's separated from God. I, honestly, I believe that. I believe that. Are you telling me Hitler going to heaven? I'm going to say Hitler's going to heaven technically, but Hitler will be with God. There are not parallel eternities for two different kind of people. All of us are going to end up in the same place. Heaven or hell are a function of how you experience the place you're in. See, nothing can separate you from the love of God unless we change it and say, yes, it can. What church you go to, that'll separate you from the love of God. If nothing, nothing above, nothing below, come on, nothing present, nothing to come, then how have you established a, a religion that ends up with a basis for separation when you've already articulated that nothing can separate you from the love of God? Oh, yes, my church, we're gonna do my church, yes, my church. My pastor can separate you from the love of God because he'll tell you go to hell in a minute. No, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Hey, come on, y'all. Come on. Can I share with you? I'm just sharing with you my wrestlings that at some point, and because this is what I get from younger generations, they don't understand this heaven and hell mess we're talking about. What are you talking about so-and-so going to hell? That's my friend. We tight. And they'll say things like this. Well, he didn't go to church, but he was more, more godly than you, all y'all church folk. Huh? Because when I was going through my difficulties, over, the only person that helped me was, where were you? And now he's going to hell, and you're going to sit up in the church pious and go to heaven. Oh. I mean, it's, come on, y'all. I'm just saying what these are kind of conversations. None of y'all have had these conversations with Can I just ask the question, why do we have a dystopic future where the same dysfunction on the earth is eternalized in glory? Here, can I show you all how I play with this when I'm wrestling? Guess what I say? All of us will go to heaven, but all of us will not experience the same thing in heaven. Some of us will experience delight and joy. Others of us will experience gnashing of teeth. Why? When you get to heaven, every, see, we, we even say things like this, and every, all things will be exposed, come on, and you will have to confront everything you did, right? Don't we say things like that? Amen. And then the judge, a righteous judge, will say, you go to hell. Amen. And there's a gulf between you and all of this. But what if your pain is in your inclusion, not your exclusion? Do you realize love can hurt you bad? When you have to confront and you got to come out of your denial about your racism, your sexism, your materialism, come on, when you got to come out of the de a denial of the lies that you have been embracing and you got to confront it before God, and then God says, come on in. Guess what you're going to say? Oh, hell. <laughs> You see, the love draws you in, and you got to now live with the memory of your dysfunction, which every day of your life you live in what? Pain. In other words, in heaven, you got to grow to learn the joy of God's grace. Huh? No, can I, make it, can I make it another? Can I make it another way? And God shows you all the things that God had for you, and you fought against God and denied yourself everything that God had for you. And then God shows you not only did you wound these, not only did you do this, not only did you do that, but this is what I desired for you. This, and you say, 
God, that is what you had for me? Yes. And I blew it? Yes. Oh, hell. <laughs> now, now, here's what I'm wrestling with. And I don't know, y'all, but all I'm saying is, is when I wrestle with a new generation, this idea of ultimate separation and division, they see that the glorification of your arrogance. And that you have created in the future the world that you've made down here. And you made God's future just like your present and your history. Can we wrestle to the degree we think maybe God's love is bigger? And this isn't anything new. Any of y'all study church history? Even Origen said Satan himself will come running. Every knee will bow and say, mm -hmm. hallelujah. One of the ways I try to demonstrate this in my class. Um, um, and what time is it? Uh, 2.25. Two, two what? 2.25. Good. I got five minutes. I'll end on this story. Huh? No, no. I want to get some questions, and I want to, I want to get, let you all exhale and breathe before we come to our closing. Okay? <laughs> Um, uh, now he messed up my train of thought. What was I going to say? <laughs> what was I talking huh? What did I tell him? <laughs> oh, I give him the illustration. I'll say, how many of you all have children? And they'll raise their hands and say, oh, yeah. And I'll, you know, I'll, say, I'll say, tell me something about your children. Oh, so and so and so. And I just love them so much. You know, blah, 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 blah. I said, if your child messed up and was going to hell, what would you do? And most of them, first of all, they gave me anything. Well, if my child was going to hell, you want to honor God true? And some would say, well, hey, that was his decision. He made his decision. You know, that was his free will. He made that decision. But there'll be multiple people who say something like this. If my child was going to hell, I would be willing to take their place. You're not fit for heaven till you're willing to go to hell for somebody going there. Because that's what God did for you. When you know the Christ, it doesn't send others to hell. It renews your commitment to go to hell to make sure somebody else is delivered. Uh-oh. Listen again. You're not fit for heaven until you're willing to go to hell for somebody else. So y'all know, I told you I've been preaching there a long time. A few a couple of years ago, you know what I preached one morning at the church? I said, church, this morning I want to tell you something that I have desired to tell you for years. And I believe today is the day that we're positioned to say it. Here is your sermon for today. All y'all go to hell. <laughs> and there was a gas, you know. <sighs> <sighs> and I said, no, no, don't leave me. Because as your pastor, I will go to hell for you. That those who love God deeply, if they see somebody lost, they will say, take my place. Because they know a Christ who did that for them. Come on. And I said, all of us who are in this church today, ought to renew our commitment to go to hell rather than keep trying to get to heaven. Now, you know that felt like a lid balloon. I said, now, but I, you know, I appreciate it. I said, listen to me, listen to me, because then I played again. Guess what? I said, if all of us would go to hell, we could change hell into a worship center. <laughs> No, no. What if all of us who are in the church said for all the people who are out there who are outside the church, heaven is for you because we're going to hell. And all these folk who were excluded would be marching in and we would be in hell. But guess what we could do? If all of us went to hell, we could raise hell and say, get the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, our presence would transform the nature of hell. So what you call hell is the location of the church. And now there is no hell. It's a worship center. And if you want to make it plain, instead of moving your church out of that neighborhood, Do y'all understand what I'm saying? And I know it's different, but this is part of the devolution. God, this church is willing to go to hell. And it going to hell is what conquers hell. And going to hell is what affirms and confirms you're fit for heaven. I thought about that, maybe true, with my grandson, because yesterday he plucked my last nerve. Huh? Come on. I saw him being disrespectful. I had heard the day before some words that shouldn't have come out of his mouth. He think he'd grown, and I watched him yesterday. He was being disrespectful to show off for some of the other kids. Hmm? Come on, y'all. And, and, and Ted, I'm going to be, I was honest. I was at a point where I was just thinking, I'm going to go put my hands on him. Smack him up. <laughs> huh? And I felt perfectly, huh, in order to do it. But for some reason, I just backed off. I didn't say anything. I just told him, you know, I'm very, very disappointed. Blah, 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 blah. And then today, guess what I realized? And I just felt it when I was preaching. It's time for me to go to hell with him. Do you understand what I'm saying? And rather to jack him up, I'm going to call tonight and I'm going to set up a time where he sits with granddaddy. And granddaddy is going to enter his pain and my pain to bring some healing. And if it doesn't change, if I feel like I'd like to kick it to the curb, don't you ever come by here again. Don't, I'm going to say, I'm going to hell, God. I'm going to hell for him. And please let him experience the promise. Because can I tell you all something? It entered my spirit to say to him, what? You're going to end up shot. Come on, you're going to end up in the street. Do you understand? Huh? And I was sending him to hell rather than going to hell. And he's going to experience a grandfather who speaks heaven and life to him when I was prepared to speak hell and death to him. We're the preacher who gives these lectures doesn't even know how to model it in his own house. And it's going to be hard, y'all, because I'm kind of old school with, hmm? I, don't, I don't take disrespect. I love the kids, and they know that, but they know don't, don't, don't this, that will not be tolerated. But I know the history, what's, what's going on with this young man. Can I be honest? I was speaking abandonment in my heart rather than presence. That maybe even the reason this young man who is not blood related, but you've taken, you have taken, your family circle has taken him. Maybe the very reason he is here is because God has orchestrated the tapestry of time and circumstance in such a way. He trusted you enough to go to hell with him. Do I tell him where he's going and me celebrate where I'm going? Or do I say, I will not go anywhere without you? Destiny 
design, dystopia. And the reason I'm saying all of this is, have we ever thought about what we're preaching? Have we ever thought and said, are there people that we're preaching to every week that we're just missing them, their pain, their hurt? And actually, they have never connected with me because I preach sermons, but I never connect with them. And now, God, as I have grown to a deeper connection with you, that connection with you has drawn me into deeper connection with everybody who comes into my life. And sometimes, God, I feel a little hurt. But I will not allow my hurt to cause me to flee my calling and my relationship with you. Last thing, and then we'll have some questions. I can never control what comes at me. If you're in ministry, can you, can I know, can you, uh, you all don't know this. You're in the United Methodist, and so you wouldn't know it. But, <laughs> but there are some mean folk in the church. <laughs> No, yeah, there are, there, are, there are, folk in church can do some mean things. And sometimes that mean spirit can be directed at you. And you're sitting up here wondering, all I've done is try to love them, and where is this coming from? And sometimes, can I say it? You almost want to look at God and say, God, you know what? You can take this job and shove it. <laughs> no, no, seriously. And guess what? Sometimes you even got to be in denial because that's a bad person. That's a bad pastor. You tell me you, you should never tell God that God, God wants to use. No, no. How, how can you be called and say that? Huh? It's precisely because I am called that I'm saying that. You understand why I'm, I'm so called, God? I don't, I don't. How can people do this? How can you give so much and then folk trample on the heart and the hands that give? How can these folk be sitting over here praising God and be a leader in the church and be just as foul and nasty in spirit when it comes to how we care for each other? How do you do this? And then you're like Jeremiah. I said I wasn't going to tell nobody. <laughs> I told you I quit God, but excuse me, it's like fire, <laughs> shut up in my bones. <laughs> now, but here's what I always teach folk. I can't control what comes at me, but I am responsible for what comes from me. And I can never allow what comes at me to dictate what comes from me, because if what's coming at me dictates what comes from me, what's coming f at me is now in me, and I am no different than that which is coming at me. I respond out of this relationship and this love for God. Can I tell you, one of the places you have to begin taking authority is in your own house. How many of us work on this in the church and don't work on it in our families? I said this last week. Don't live your life in such a way that everybody knows you're a wonderful Christian except the people you sleep with. <laughs> Amen. So even as we wrestle, Take care of yourselves. Maintain a deep devotional relationship with God. Acknowledge that you're not finished and you're not perfect. That in spite of any degree, any capacity, any gift, any talent, God, I'm available to you for conviction, for growth, for development. Because God, you have trusted me with a treasure 
and you've trusted me with a people. And those people, no matter how much they pluck my nerves, are precious to you. Give me the strength and the wisdom to handle what is precious to you. And God, part of this response is because guess what? I'm precious to you. And God will. God will take care of you. And I pray that we can envision a future where God is greater than the fall. God bless you. To you all, what's the time? If you all want time, I'll, 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 re I'll, re I'll receive a couple questions. I may not have the capacity to respond, uh, but I will receive. <laughs> Yeah. What would you like for us to sing? <laughs> Get her to repeat it. What do you all need to sing? <laughs> what would you like for us to sing? To sing? Yes. Oh. Sing. I'm sorry. Where I'm from, let's sing something. No. Uh, you know what? You're going to sing it in a minute. About bringing forth the kingdom. Now, some people don't use kingdom language because that is freighted with masculine imagery, and they will say, bring forth the rule or the fulfillment of God. God, can I please be an agent with you in not sanctioning the darkness and the distortion, but can I, God, be a partner with you in living into a future it will let us experience a new heaven <laughs> and a new earth. You know, really, that's... So you're getting ready to sing it shortly. Your worship planners, uh, they inspired my moments, my thinking, uh, and so they have birthed this reflection <laughs> um, that really says that it's time for us to change our preaching, but we won't change our preaching if we don't revisit our theology. Thank you. Other questions? Hey, man, I think people are, uh, you know, Jesus had an amazing way of assessing the condition of his listeners. Oh, Jesus, see, we don't, we don't realize that. We'll plan a program, and we got to do everything on the program. I was even taught, never deviate from the established design of, guess what? If you sit out there and you see something is what? Not functioning the way it should, change on your feet. Let the spirit have some authority. Guess what? Guess what? I change my sermons all the time. I was taught never change your sermon. Don't go in, but guess what? I will shorten a sermon or make two, one sermon into two or three sermons because I recognize I'm looking at the people and they can't, they can't take it. Jesus will be preaching and preaching up a storm and say, wait a minute, these folk tired. Let them go. Hey, man, or what? They're hungry. Feed them. Why are we so afraid to see with eyes that see the people at the same time we see the text? <laughs> Maybe that I need. Mm -hmm. And most of the time when we preach too long, it has nothing to do with God. It has to do with our egos. We got, we got to get rid of it. So um, I would just, uh, just, just, just say that. And don't forget, don't be like, was it Paul who preached and the man was sitting in the window, Eutychus? And he fell out and died. Don't preach until the folk die. Come on, dear man. <laughs> All right, come on. Let's 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 bring this to a close. Well, towards the close of that book of the Library of Faith called the Bible, there's a book called Revelation. In the seventh chapter, verse nine and following, the vision revealed is this. After this, I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, 
robed in white with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and all around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God singing, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these, robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who's seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. What happened up there? I sent an error and I said, how big is your good? And it was supposed to be, how big is your God? And notice what they did. They left the good there, but made one of the O's big. So your, the bigness of your goodness is predicated upon how big your God is. Uh-huh. Hallelujah. Thank you for that clarification. And uh, you'll notice they not only misspelled discipleship, they now misspelled my name. Uh, 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 which is fine because he knows my name. All right. Very quickly. My family, again, thank you for the sharing today. Let me thank again the United Methodist Church for seeding my formation. Mm -hmm. Where I first became enamored with this issue of a God and know so many things I didn't understand. And not only not thank the pastors, I thank Gertrude Dixon, Isla Williams, Harry Jones, Delma Mosby, my Sunday school teachers, who sat around that table and used to teach me about this and that and challenge me. But I, above all, I thank them for loving me and caring for me because they didn't even know that there was stuff going on in me that I didn't really know how to love me. Mm -hmm. And they helped me experience fully. And I thank you all again for inviting me to be here today. And I want to uh, just conclude with this thought, which kind of capsulizes and concludes our day. Um, do you have the outline for the, the sermon? The last outline, not, not, your, not your old song we're going to sing as we depart. Okay, maybe you, don't, may, maybe you don't have it. Can I? Here's the outline. The sermon, the sermon title, again, that you saw up there, uh, look again, can you count? How big is your God? This is the story of where the visionary says, I looked before and then I looked again. And this, when I looked again, I saw a number that I could not number. They were from every tribe, every nation, every clime. They were from everywhere. And I wondered who they were that these are those who have been washed in the blood of the crucified one and their raiment reveals a relationship with God. Well, who did all this, God and the lamb? 
This is God's doing. And then they broke out praising God, praising, praising the God of creation, the God who were doing this. And here's, if you want the outline, it's the limitation, the multiplication, the causation, and the celebration. Look at it. God bless this moment. Can you count? The word says, then I looked again. It lets you know that there was what? A previous look. And what I speak now is the product of at least a second look. What I'm communicating now is is a then look. It's after I'd look one time, and uh, 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 now I'm looking again. What was the first look? The first look was 12 tribes times 12,000. It even names there were 144,000. The first look, I could tell you what tribes were there, the 12 tribes. Come on. I could tell you who was in. I was tell you who was included. In other words, the first look based upon the text, was the look of limitation. It was the look that allows you to limit who's in and who's out. I can name who's in. I can tell you, you're in, you're in, you're out, because you're not in the 144,000. And this is not to diminish the significance of the 144,000 in the religious history of the nation of Israel, uh, nor into the history of the Christian church. But what it says is there is a limited number in, and you can define it. You have the theology to establish who's in, who's out, but there's a problem with who's in. I can name the 12 tribes. But I don't see any Akan. I don't see any Ebo. I don't see any Nur. I don't see, come on, you understand? Know I don't see any Ashante. I don't see any tribes other than this select few. I don't see any of the people from Japan or China, huh? Or Korea. I don't see anybody, huh? For the indigenous population. In the West, I don't see any of them. In other words, there's a select group. And we like that select group. Why? I'm in it. I'm in it. And I'll tell you in a minute, I'm in it. I'm in it. I'm in it. Too. But do you realize every time you can establish a number, you establish a limitation and mean automatically that my limitation ex creates an exclusion. So guess what? God says, I looked again, and my limitation became a magnificent multiplication. It was a number that no human being can number. If the Bible says you can't number it, then why are you establishing who's in and out? Because if there's one person I put out, then I have numbered it and made it one less than what it was before I put them out. You just count it. And you say, I don't know who's in, but I know who's not. You just established the number because of those who are not. And so the amazing way that when you look again, small exclusionary limiting numbers are no longer operative in your sight or your discourse. It's not 144,000. It's a, no, a number that none of us can number. Oh, no, wait a minute. I can go to chapter 17 and 18, and I can tell you who's in. There'll be no uh, idolaters. There'll be no whoremongers. There'll be no, and I can tell you all the no's. Because I know who's a no. Come on. I can tell you who's not included. I can tell you who's on the outside. I can tell you anybody who did not join the group I joined. Let me make it plain. Anybody who was not born where they were immediately indoctrinated into Christianity. 
where they were literally taught about the failures of Christianity and how this religion was a religion of oppression that came and stole our land and stole us. And now that I have learned to never trust that religion again, you're not in. You're not in because you didn't grow up in a Christian nation. You're not in because you were the victim of the violations huh, perpetrated by those who, perpet who called themselves Christian, and now it's, been, it's caused a level of distrust in you that you will never listen to them. You're not in because you don't live where I live. You don't go to church where I go to church. You don't act like I act. You don't name God the way I name God. Therefore, you're not in. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of the limitation, God says, look again. And when I looked again, I saw a number that no man, and they were from where? Everywhere. There was no tribe left out. There was no nation, nation left out. There was no tongue left out. Oh, there were, I couldn't tell you who it was. Hmm. But didn't the book say there will be none of these people there? Absolutely. There will be no idolaters. <laughs> Why? Because every knee will bow and every tongue will. No. There will be no. No. Why? Not because they're not drawn in, but because that type of thinking and behavior no longer exists because every tongue will confess. Oh. That won't be there. Because that won't be our character anymore. We would have stood before the great throne. And all the evil would have been revealed. And that possibility would no longer be resident in us. Hmm. I see a number that no man can number. God is in the business of multiplying our limitations. Where you put a period, God puts dot, dot, dot to be continued. Where you put a period and says, I'm through, God says, there's more. And where you could count, God says, if you ever look again, you will not be able to count. And then it says, why are these people here? Read it closely. If they're here, it doesn't say because they join a church. It doesn't say they're here because of their confession, they're here because of the love of he who sits on the throne and the lamb. I always say this. Jesus may not be the only way, but he is the way. Because if he is not the way, there is no way. Why? He is the way that reveals the character of God and God's loving, redemptive presence. And he is the only way. The only way is the love of God. The only way is a God of grace and mercy. The only way is the God revealed in Jesus Christ, the God who shows that God is with us and a God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He is the only way. But since he's the only way, could there be then more, one, more than one way to travel the way? One way, multiple vehicles on the way. Hmm. Hmm. And the ultimate testimony of my deep love of the Christ and the deep call of Christianity is that I no longer have to exclude and destroy somebody else to come to my fulfillment. In fact, when I experience my fulfillment, it will be with you. God multiplies all of the human limitations that we're constantly making. What is the causation of the multiplication? God. The word is very clear. God. 
And so I'll tell anybody, how is this possible? God. See, other people can create exclusion. They're all around. They speak it all the time. But there's one great God who speaks the magnificent of full inclusion. The fact that I'm a Christian lets me be able to see the fullness of God's design that does not make the fulfillment a privilege for Christians, but the gift of God to creation. I'm calling you home. And when others would kick you out, I say welcome. Now the welcome may hurt. Come on. Have you ever been hurt by love? Have you ever done something so wrong and somebody loved you when you were wrong and you wish they would have kicked you or slapped you? <laughs> Amen. Love does hurt. Not because you're abandoned all the time, but sometimes live love hurts when you're welcome. When you come to the knowledge, look what I have done to this family. Look what I've done to my partner. Look how I violated them. And then you spend years, what? Trying to restore the joy of loving them. Mm. God says, my love cannot be enumerated. My love, Ephesians 3 tells you that. How do you measure the depth, the breadth of God's love? You can't. He tells you you can't. Then why do we keep wanting to put limitations where God performs more marvelous, merciful multiplication with a singular causation? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Come on. Whoever would accept this gift of love, whoever would say thank you, hmm? and there's going to be a moment where all you can do is say thank you. And your thank you may lead to a shout or it may lead to a weep as you recognize God loves you. And our desire is to teach you the truth so that you may live this life and eternity in absolute joy. Why? Because of he or she who sits upon the throne and the Lamb. These are they whose the love revealed in God in the shedding of blood has covered them. And I can't place a limitation where God's in the business of multiplication unless I don't really know the causation. If you don't know the causation, you'll always speak limitation. But once you truly know the causation, then it God is not this. And you try to get in it. This is for you. But you're not baptized. This is for you. When you saw this, this day, you are with me in paradise where the world builds a wall and says, don't you let them cross that wall. And the only way you can cross the wall is that you affirm me. And you know what, how the story ends? You know what the story says? And it says everybody there begin to wave palms, shout, amen. Guess what? After you've moved beyond limitations to multiplication and fully embraced the causation, there's going to be some celebration. Yeah. 
everybody, hallelujah, will begin to praise and celebrate a God, a God who breaks down barriers, transcends division, heals the brokenness, a God who's going to wipe away all of my tears, a God who's going to cause the wicked to cease from troubling, a God who will allow the weary to be at rest, a God who will create welcome space where you I've created brokenness. God, I think I need to shout. <laughs> I think I need to glorify you. God, I think this is a moment where we need to stop our stolified, come on, rigidity. This is a moment where we should stop being trying to be formulas and formulating. This is a moment where I realize God, God's love is amazing and I'm the beneficiary of that love. This is a moment where I need to shout hallelujah. This is a moment where I need to tell somebody, thank you God. Thank you, thank you, because the walls that I've been taught to build to keep other people out also have kept me out. But I'm so glad that your love is greater than their walls. Thank you, Lord. Sometimes where we are, we'll create different levels of anxiety. Can I confess to you all this morning? When I got up this morning, it was about 6.30, quarter to 7, and I turned on the news, and then I started listening to the 7 o'clock news, and the first thing is I was met by these pictures of little children blown apart in Syria. I was met by these pictures of people being displaced and of how it's only getting worse and worse and worse. And I was met with all of these commentators talking about how this is going to create an avenue for uh, Russia and Syria and Iran to get back in. And all of this, start talking about all these negative things and all of these outcomes. And what a tragic mistake it was when you reach the point that the people who died for you will have to die because of you. And they were doing this. They were saying, saying all of this and talking about the negative. And can y'all, can y'all be honest? Can I just be honest with you? I start feeling my chest get tight. Am I the only one? See, I carry stress here. Some folk carry it here. Some folk carry it here. But I can view, I, I start tensing up. And I literally had to stop and ask God, God, can you help me? Step into the moment that you've given me to step into a moment of hope and promise and not constrained and confined by the powers of death that I feel around me. I start feeling down, y'all. I'm being honest with you. And so I woke up this morning almost wishing I didn't have to do anything, wishing I could find a place to escape. Am I the only one? Well, sometimes this feels like, oh, can I just run somewhere? Can I just go somewhere and get out of all of this? Can I just step away? And I wonder, you know, I can understand why some people will turn to a bottle or a pill. I mean, come on. Amen. Let, let me, all I want to do, I can't stand this. God, enough is enough. And immediately when I start thinking, and guess what I start thinking? I start projecting the most negative realities. Come on, y'all. Oh, Lord, and then this is going to happen, and this is going to happen. But it came back into my mind, something that happened to me at Christmas. At Christmas, I have 21 grandchildren. 18 of them were at my house two years ago. I'm very low maintenance, y'all. I don't have a great big house, y'all. I'm, I'm very, I'm, you know, I don't need a, mm -hmm. and if you got 18 grandchildren, you ain't going to have a whole lot anyway. Uh, 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 uh. So I don't have a big, you know, and so they were there and we were watching a movie. I've shared this story and I'm sitting in, a, in my chair and I got one on each knee, two sitting on the arm, one between my legs, another one on my neck, and we're all watching this movie and it's a movie about 
journeying or something to the center of the earth. And in the movie, they keep going deeper and the darkness gets deeper and deeper and the music begins to set the tone of the reality and the music gets more and more bass. You know, it started out, you know, boom, 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 boom. And, I, and it even started grabbing you and you were all tense sitting there. All of a sudden, this big octopus looking thing jumps out of the darkness, grabs a submarine and rawr, 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 starts rocking it around. I grab my grandson's hand, Caleb, and say, Caleb, I'm scared. I'm scared. Oh, Lord, I'm scared. That thing is going to get us. He said, oh, Papa, Papa, Papa. He squeezed up close. I'm scared, too. What are we going to do? Oh, Papa, what are we going to do? And all of a sudden, he snatched his hand away and said, wait a minute, Papa. This is a repeat. <laughs> I know how the story ends. Come on, what am I trying to tell you? Sometimes the darkness is deep. Sometimes the enemy is upon us. But every now and then you need to shout, this is a repeat. I know how the story ends. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. But early one morning he got up with all power. Rejoice, my brothers and sisters. I know how the story ends. Man, would you please stand as we are praising the Lord? Uh, our closing hymn is Bring Forth the Kingdom. That is our job. Amen? Amen. Yes. You are so for the earth, so people so for the kingdom of God. Share the flavor of quick. Um, I just have, most of you have received an, an evaluation form. Those of you in the back, I didn't get up front before we began, but there are evaluation forms on a small table that is directly on your exit. 
And if you'll take just a second and fill them out, fine. If not, you can email your results to Mandy Newman at VAUMC.org. Easy to remember. Um, and also your CEU forms are on the back table as well. So grab those on your way out. And um, are there any other announcements for the good? No? Again, we thank you very much, Reverend Dr. <laughs> Kenny. We thank you for being here today. Appreciate your time. Um, I hope that you were all blessed, and I send you forth with this benediction. Pray with me. Go forth knowing the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ his Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. I pray you go in peace. Amen. Amen. And may you have safe journey. <laughs>